and disclaimer. The views and opinions expressed by individuals on this platform, the callers plus invited guests, are their own. The information you hear does not reflect the overall views of all parties associated with this brand. We encourage everyone to research all things heard live or via archive for edification purposes. Discretion is advised. That dial. You're now listening to the Big Talk Free Radio. Help keep the show on the air. If you want to help, you can send your donation to PayPal. The email is debatetalkforyou at gmail.com or through Cash App, dollar sign Sal Showtime. Thanks for your support. Peace, peace, peace. What it is, it's Brother Tyvon Swainell, a.k.a. the Orthodox Moor, a.k.a. the Seven Pillars Saracen. And this evening, I am pleased to bring to you a debate talk for you dialogue with Brother Alton Johnson. Um, I do believe he's an urban apologist. Um, I will double check to see if he classifies himself as such. Um, and one of the reasons I had him come on this evening is I heard him have a really interesting uh, dialogue on his channel recently about um, the concept of replacement of replacement theology or God's divine plan, which is it really? So I wanted to have him come on and give his understanding on what he's talking about um, so he can give his perspective from his mouth and uh, we're not getting it from someone else's. You know what I'm saying? We're going straight to the horse's mouth and getting what he's saying. Um, if you're familiar with Elder Mike uh, from our previous conversation, you'll probably be, be familiar with Alton Johnson. Uh, you can see them both on, on their channels. Um, Alton's channel, channel I have a link below, um, but you've also probably seen them on, on Brand TV, etc. cetera. Um, and gratefully, um, we have uh, Alton Johnson here with us this evening for a couple of hours to have a good dialogue. So with that, I'm going to bring Alton in and let him introduce himself. Peace, brother man. How you doing? Hey, how you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Blessed, blessed. <laughs> Thank you for having me on. No worries. Thank you for coming on, man. Um, can you give a little bit of your background for people who may not be familiar with you? Yeah. Um, well, I started my YouTube channel maybe about about five years ago. Well, actually, I think it was more like 10 years ago, but I just started doing, um, you know, like Christian content, maybe about five, five or six years ago. And, uh, you know, I've addressed everything from atheism to the conscious community. Um, and, you know, addressing uh, a lot of people may know one of my most popular videos, which is addressing the foolishness in the black church, you know, currently has like 1.2 million views. Uh, and that's how a lot of people got familiar with who I was. But, you know, just like you said earlier, you've probably seen me on Brother Berean's channel uh, a few times. And uh, currently uh, I am dealing with Hebrew Israelism. I've been dealing with it for maybe about a couple of years now. So that is kind of like the arena that I'm in. And, um, and that's basically about it with me, you know. I, I, you know, I don't, I don't really have too much more to say about myself. So, what was your entry into Hebrew Israelism, as you call it? Like, what got you interested into into that and, and dealing with that in terms of uh, apologetics? Now, I I remember when let me see, this had to be back around 2015 to 2016, mm -hmm. and I. At first, I wanted to stay away from it because that was something that Vocat Malone was doing. And to be honest, I was like, man, I don't feel like getting into, you know, trying to learn what they believe and all of that stuff. You know, somebody just comes to me and they want to, you know, uh, ask me about Hebrew, Hebrew Israelism. I'll just I'll just push them over there to vocab and G-Man. G-Man was doing that at the same time, too. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't really too interested in, in Hebrew Israelism. How this kind of got started was I started getting a lot of um comments on especially my, my 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 most popular video and i kept getting these all of these messages saying that you know hey brother you know we need you know i i i, I, I can show you the truth and i can show you who you are and all of that so i wasn't really you know i, I would engage people a little bit but i wasn't really too much into it so um and what started happening was that I was getting so many messages 
And I started having some different back and forths with, with some people and it was throwing out scripture. And I was just like, well, that's that's not right. Let me, you know, let me show you the scripture that is correct. And uh, once I started doing that for quite a while, then I said, well, maybe I need to start making some videos because it seems like that people who are engaging me, I don't think that they understand that I don't. I, I'm not a Hebrew Israelite. I, I don't. I, I don't have that same view. So I started making, you know, little dropping little videos here and there. So then there was a guy. I can't remember his name, but this was maybe about two or three years ago. Probably about three years ago. And a guy wanted to interview me, and he was. I think he is a um, more like a conservative type guy. He's not. He's not a believer or anything like that. And this was during the whole thing with. The uh, uh, you remember the the kids at the was it in Washington D.C. or at the Capitol or something um, where you had the Hebrew Israelite guys and then yeah. You had the, yeah 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 you had the you had the Indian guy that was banging the drum in their faces and stuff yeah so it was around that time and of course I had been making videos but I had made videos before that so I think he saw some of my videos and he interviewed me and when he interviewed me. Um, you know, it was maybe like a little 15 minute interview and, you know, I kind of gave him some insight on what Hebrew Israelites believe and stuff like that. And for some reason, GMS, they ended up seeing the video or, or the interview. And I just had response video after response video after response video. And it was making so many videos against me. It must be like a hundred and something videos out there against me from that one interview. So then that's when I say, you know what? I need to start making more interviews and I need to start addressing, uh, you know, what's actually going on or uh, why, I, why I don't believe in Hebrew Islam, Hebrew Islamism and why I believe that it's false. Now, I started dealing with the camps because I didn't even know that there was any such thing as moderates. I was didn't I was dealing with the camps primarily and camps was just making videos about me and all of this stuff. So I was kind of going back and forth with them. And then that kind of died down. And then I started having some moderates come after me. And once I started having moderates come after me, then that's when I just kind of started engaging more and more with Hebrew Israelism. And just about everything that I've done has been in a defense of the faith or defense of personal attacks against me. And then, of course, as I'm defending myself and making videos, then other people are making videos about me, commenting about me. So it just kind of became like this big snowball. So that's how I kind of started getting into addressing Hebrew Israelism. Okay. Would I be correct in calling you a uh, 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 urban apologist? Do you self-identify as such or do you not? Identify um, as such? Well, at, at first I, I really didn't, but I understood what people were saying when they called me an urban apologist, you know, and I was like, okay, I get it. I mean, I'm not going to sit back and get upset. Uh, somebody calls me an urban apologist, but I think that right now at this point, um, I, I will consider myself an urban apologist because I do deal with a lot of issues that affect the urban community uh, faith wise. So, you know, of course, I'm not really dealing too much with like Mormonism or too much like Jehovah's Witness or anything like that, mm -hmm. because although you do have a small percentage of people in our community that are into those th those different religions, um, Hebrew Israelism. And like the conscious community and stuff like that is like really popular uh, amongst the black community. So those are the things that I address because, um, you know, I just want to be able to spread the gospel to uh, our people. You know, if you know, if I can put it that way, you know, our people mm -hmm. as some black people. Um, so since I have a lot of uh, and plus I have. Some friends of family, you know, who has started to kind of move towards the whole Hebrew Israelite movement. So then that's when I just I say, you know, I really need to start addressing this, uh, these things. And I really need to start paying attention and studying what Hebrew Israelites believe. So therefore, I can be able to correctly address it and, um, you know, present the gospel at the same time. OK. So in your view of Christianity, are, do the Israelites you deal with, do they tell you that uh, you deal with replacement theology? And do you consider replacement theology a loaded term? Yeah, I do. I do cons uh, consider it a loaded term. And there are people, 
Hebrew Israelites who have uh, accused me of believing in replacement theology. And I'm just like, well, that's funny because, first of all, I've never made a video uh, saying that my position is that I believe in replacement theology. And some of these people have never even had a conversation with me. So I'm just like, why would you believe that I that I believe in replacement theology? So I get uh, a, a lot of people who say that that's what I believe because they have a presupposition that this is what Christians believe without actually sitting down and having a conversation and asking someone, someone like me, do I believe in replacement theology or not? Now, I have had a, a couple of people ask me that and I have responded to them, but for the most part, a lot of people have that presupposition that I believe that um, Christians have replaced Israel and what's kind of prompted me to do that live video uh, and what, you're, what you referenced earlier that is what prompted me to do that to kind of put it out there like this is what I believe and this is what the Bible says so what would you call what you believe like how, how would you word it uh, when it comes to like replacement theology or just like my title as a Christian or yeah because I think it, like in your video you were talking about it as like the divine will of God or like part of the divine plan or God's plan or something like that like so, so yeah. do, you, do you think it's replacement theology or do you or how, how would you word it and how would you describe what you, what you believe on the matter well, I, I mean, I don't have a specific title for it, but uh, just like I said in the video, um, it was always a part of God's plan, you know, um, to for, for him to save people from every tribe, tongue, and nation, you know, background, ethnicity, all of that. Salvation was never just meant for one group of people based on their bloodline or their heritage. You know, it was always God's plan from uh, from Genesis, from Genesis 3 and 15, since the fall of man through Adam's sin until Revelation. Um, it's always been a part of his plan to redeem a remnant for himself. And it's never just been Israel. Like Israel has never been the plan. They they were a part of the plan, but ne they were never the plan. You see what I'm saying? So, and that's and and that's basically the gist of the video that I was that that I was making. So, would you consider yourself a progressive covenantalist? Are you familiar with the with that concept or or not? I've heard people throw that term around, but I, to be honest, I, I I'm not really sure <laughs> what that means because I really haven't had too many discussions with anyone who has used that term. Mm -hmm. um, but. I mean, if you do have um, somewhat of, an, uh, of a definition, then, you know, I would, you know, if you can tell me what the definition is and I can basically say if I agree with it or not. So from my understanding, uh, from what I remember, um, a debate that uh, that was on this channel that I moderated from Vocab Malone and, and Yara Ben Nazareth right. on the topic, I do believe that they that their belief system is that um, the church is the fulfillment of national Israel. So in the end times, the church um, um, consisting of of like Messianic Jews and then and then the Gentile believers becomes the, the fulfillment of national Israel. Uh, I would say I, I, I disagree with that. OK. Um, yeah, I don't I, I don't believe that that, uh, you know, salvation is and I'm choosing my words carefully here. <laughs> you know, I, I don't believe that salvation was always just for Israel. Um, I believe that Israel was to, uh, at a certain point in time, that they were supposed to be that light on the hill, that that beacon of light to, you know, guide people to God. Mm -hmm. But as we can see throughout Scripture, you know, they failed miserably. But I believe that the promise was always given to Abraham through his offspring, which is um, which is Christ. Christ is the promise uh, of Abraham's seed. And Christ is also that seed that is mentioned in Genesis 3.15 when the Lord is speaking to the woman and he's saying that she is going to have a seed and he is going to crush the head of the serpent, but the serpent is going to bruise his heel. So that is the promise that even throughout scripture, everyone has always been focused on and been looking to that Messiah. And that Messiah has a remnant, even when we read John 17, um, because I'm also, I also believe in predestination. I believe that God has already 
predestined who he's going to have uh, in his kingdom and who he's not going to have. And this was, even when we read scripture, this happened before, in John 17, uh, this was before the foundations of the earth. So that remnant was always there. And it wasn't, it wasn't because, it wasn't until Israel came on the scene. You see what I'm saying? It wasn't that 1500 year period from Adam to uh, to Moses that God somehow said, well, now I'm just going to have, you know, a chosen people. No, he had already had a chosen people before it had even gotten to Israel. So that's why I don't believe that, you know, the church that salvation was for Israel, but then Israel blows it. And then the church comes in and replaces Israel. Uh, I believe that it was God's divine decree from the start. You see what I'm saying? And, um, and, and, you know, like I said earlier, I don't believe that Israel was the plan. Israel was a part of the plan. So are, are you a Calvinist or, or no? I heard you talking about like the predestination concept and like there's, there was predestined who was going to do what. So are, are you a Calvinist or no? Well, the, the, the title Calvinist can be pretty loaded. <laughs> Just like you alluded to earlier, that could be another mm -hmm. loaded term. Right. Uh, but I do agree with the five points. Um, I have read some things from John Calvin and um, and Calvinism now has kind of became this whole cultural thing. You know, some people use Calvinism as being a part of this this particular culture. And I don't get into all of that. But, you know, when I do read the five points of Calvinism, I do I, I do believe uh, and I do agree with the five points of Calvin uh, of John Calvin. So. So if I hear you correctly, I'm hearing you say that you believe in the five points of Calvinism. You just don't call yourself a Calvinist. Yeah, correct. Because, um, and, and right now I just got so much going through my mind, but I can't remember what it was. But there's a couple of things that that I've read from John Calvin that I haven't really uh, just that that I haven't really agreed with. Um, but when it comes to the five points, I I do believe in the five points. I do hold to the to the five points. But if me, but, you know, agreeing with the five points make me a Calvinist, then, you know, so be it. <laughs> That's the way I look at it. But I don't uh, self-identify as a Calvinist. I'm not walking around saying that, Yo, you know, I'm a Calvinist and, you know, this is what I believe okay. because I've actually had discussions with people who are Calvinists and, um, and some of these, some of those guys can be, you know, like totally out there. So that's why I'm careful of calling myself that. Okay. Um, in your construct, what does national Israel look like in, in uh, the new kingdom or the new Jerusalem, etc.? Uh, you mean like as an ethnicity or, or heritage, like, uh, you're talking about like the Jews today, like, like where do they fit in, in the kingdom of God? So, yeah. So you were talking about this concept of a, of a predetermined remnant, correct? Right. Correct. Um, so, um, I'm assuming that remnant consists. Does it consist of? I'm, I'm, assu I'm assuming it consists of Israel and Gentiles, correct? Or, or no? Yes, yes. It, it would be um, um, people who are ethnically Israel and people who are Gentiles. Okay, so for the people who are ethnic, ethnically Israel, what does that look like for them? What does that construct look like for them? Well, I mean, it looks the same as anyone else. You know, if you do not, uh, you know, uh, follow Christ, if you do not submit to Christ, then you know, then you're going to be outside of the kingdom, you know, because salvation is only through Christ. Uh, you, you know, it's not by law keeping or commandment keeping or anything like that. But if you submit yourself to Christ and you believe that he is uh, your Lord and Savior, then, you know, no matter what you call yourself, I mean, you know, you can uh, you can call yourself whatever you want. You can be from Israel and you can have the ethnic background, but if you deny Jesus as Lord and Savior, then you're basically going to end up with the same people who <laughs> uh, 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 who totally flat out reject Jesus, uh, people who are in cults and false religions and things of that nature. Okay, so so many people of, of the Israelite tradition are going to be looking at the, the uh, uh, particularly from a Messianic perspective, will be looking in, at the New Kingdom mm -hmm. and, be, and be looking at uh, land covenants connected to what you were talking about concerning like uh, promises with abraham etc um, right so do you do for you are those land covenants still enacted or are they done away with 
No, they're done away with, and um, and the Bible clears that up, especially in Hebrews eight. So, um, the covenants that God made with with the people of Israel, um, those covenants were broken by Israel. So, since they were broken by Israel, um, you know, those covenants were basically a contract. So, once you breach a contract, that contract is null and void. So, and like I said, in Hebrews 8, Hebrews 8 basically clears that up. You read the whole chapter verse by verse, line by line, and you can see that uh, Israel did not keep keep their end of the bargain with the covenant. So therefore, uh, Christ was that new covenant, you know, through his blood, uh, th through his completed work on the cross. So there is no outstanding covenant or there is no renewed covenant between God and the people of Israel. Okay, just so, just so uh, me and the people are clear, where in Hebrews eight are you saying talks about the land covenants, etc.? Because, because the the land covenants have to do with the covenant made with Abraham. They're not, they're not like something that's just. Uh, it's not like a part of the Mosaic covenant. Oh, so, hold on one second. Let me go ahead and uh, let me go ahead and bring that up. Okay. Um, let me see if I can get down to the. You want me to show your screen, or you want to go off my screen? Uh let me see. I, I basically have the same thing pulled up. I, I could probably we could probably go ahead and share my screen. Okay. Uh, hold on, let me go ahead and blow this up. All right. Okay. All right. Yeah. All right. So there we go. Can can you see it? Yeah, let me make it a bit bigger. From, oh, that didn't work too well. Can you make it a little bit bigger? A little bit bigger? Yeah. Yeah. There we go. Okay. Is that better? Yeah, that'll work. Okay. Uh, let me see. Let me go down. Um, well, like, for instance, if we start here at uh, uh, Hebrews 8 and 7, for if that the first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. So basically, we're already seeing that the first covenant um, was not perfect, because now we have to have a second. Uh, let me see. Like, even when we go down to, to Hebrews 8 and 9, not like the first covenant that I made with their fathers. Well, actually, let's, let, let's, let's read it at verse 8. Uh, for he finds fault with them, when he says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the first covenant that I made with their mm -hmm. fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. For they did not continue in my covenant, and so I showed them, and I showed no concern for, for them, declares the Lord. Were you about to say something? No, 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 no I'm just, I'm just uh, breathing. Right, so this is from Jeremiah 31. Um... Yeah, so all of this is from, from Jeremiah 31, but when we get down here to um, Hebrews 8.13, and speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete, and what has become obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. So that is what Christ did. He makes the, he is, um, uh, he has instilled a new covenant, therefore making the first one obsolete. So, uh, so whatever covenants that God has made with Israel, uh, those covenants are obsolete. And the only covenant that we are under now is the covenant of Christ. So what about the covenants that he made with Abraham? You said the covenant that he made with Abraham? Yeah. So uh, let me let me I'm going to unshare your screen. I'm going to go to my screen. Real quick. Yeah, go ahead. So this this is the one I'm talking about in Genesis 17. Okay. Because I hear what you're saying about about the Mosaic Covenant, I, I would understand that, that most Christians are going to talk about the Mosaic Covenant done away with. Here, I'm talking about the land covenants associated with Abraham and his, and his covenants and his seed after him, etc. So in Genesis 17, 7, um, we see and it says, "And I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee and their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee." And it goes on mm -hmm. to say in uh, verse eight, "And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger." All the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. So, so just so just so I'm clear, you're saying that that Jesus coming coming and and Hebrews eight confirms that this is done away with. Yeah, and uh, and I'm actually going to 
Let me see. I'm actually gonna pull a scripture to Okay, I'll stop sharing my screen. You can share it. No, you yeah, you can go ahead. Um hold on one second. Let me go back. What is that? Um uh, yeah, here we go. All right, we can go ahead and share my screen again. I don't see there it is. Uh, there it is. Yeah. All right, so uh when we read Galatians three and sixteen. Uh now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say into offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one and your offspring, who is Christ. Right. This is what I mean. The law which came for under the 30 years afterward does not annul the covenant uh, previously ratified by God. So as to make the promise void for if the inheritance comes by the law it no longer comes by promise. But God gave it to Abraham by a promise. Right. So, um, but when we do go back up to Galatians 3 and 16, I mean, it clearly says that the promises were made to Abraham and his offspring, and it says, and to your offspring, who is Christ. So that's why I do hold a position that I hold to, that these promises were not made to a, uh, the, the promise was not made to Israel, but um, or Israel is not the promise. The nation of Israel is not the promise. Christ is the promise. Now, God did make promises to the people of Israel if they were to, uh, if they honored him as God and they were and they kept his statutes and commandments, which again, they didn't. So when they didn't do that, then that voided the covenant. But the promise has always stood uh since genesis 3 and 15 the promise of the seed of the woman which comes through abraham and then david and then you know etc cetera, etc cetera. okay so just so i'm clear what what's the promise that's given to abraham specifically that you're talking about because you're, you're saying it's singular and I'm, I'm familiar with two so so you're saying the single so, so what, which promise are you talking about yeah the um um christ the the seed you know like like i said genesis 3 let me see if i can go there uh we're gonna be going to Genesis three and fifteen. No, I'm, I'm talking about like like somewhere in between like Genesis like twelve and seventeen, like where 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 Abraham is actually talking to God and and, uh, and God's telling him to get out of the land and the certain things where the covenants being made with with him. Like where where's what what promise and all that are you talking about? Just so I'm clear. Well, if we're talking about like and, and you know once again. If you can go ahead and point me in the direction of the scripture that that you're referring to specifically. So okay, so in Genesis right. twelve, I know it talks about uh, 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 all the nations will be blessed through him. That's one promise, right? Mm -hmm. And so when you're talking about Christ, I can understand that concept, right? Right. Um, but when I when I just went to Genesis seventeen, specifically seven and eight, there was a, a not just a promise but a covenant, right? And so mm -hmm. there was a covenant given given to Abraham, um, and the sign of that covenant was circumcision, right? And so right, correct. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to figure out uh, in what you're saying where that covenant with Abraham is no longer because I because in everything you cited, you're talking about the Mosaic covenant, which I, I understand. I got you. I hear that part. I'm, yeah. I'm still, I'm still kind of just confused on how you connect, how you connect in everything to the, uh, the covenant. OK, there's the promise in Genesis 12, but the covenant made to Abraham in Genesis 17. So where is the, the covenant given to Abraham being overturned? So are you talking about Genesis 17 and two it says that I'll make my covenant between uh me and you and multiply you greatly is that what you're talking about scroll down to seven and eight where i just read that those the ones are or the ones i'm talking about now okay and i'll establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring and after you throughout the generations for an everlasting covenant uh to be god to you and to your offspring after you and i will give to you and your offspring after the land uh after you the land of your sojournings uh all the land of cana for an everlasting possession and i will be their god now, yeah, that is that you got to remember that this is before the people of Israel. Well, actually, before there was even a, a, a land of Israel, um, you know, of course, you know, uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. But then, you know, Jacob is the father of the 12 tribes. And um, uh, you have them in Egypt for just like what I just read about the 430 years. And then they come after that. And then God. I'm sorry, then Moses leads them into their own land, right? So this is this is that part of the, it's talking about the Israelites having their own land, Israel being, being a possession of 
uh, or Israel having their own land. You see what I'm saying? But of course, and that's why even as we go through like the law, like Deuteronomy, you know, Exodus, Leviticus, um, you know, we can see exactly where God had made covenants with the people of Israel. If you do this, your land is going to flourish. Uh, you, you guys are going to be blessed in the land. But if you do not do this and if you go after other gods, then your land is going to be desolate. You know, um, I'm going to remove you from that land. I'm going to pluck you out of there and your enemies are going to overtake you, et cetera, et cetera. So there was always so that covenant, like I said, it was a contract. So based on how the people obey God or, you know, if they didn't go off their other gods and other idols, then they would have that land as a possession and they were flourishing that land. But since Israel ended up going after other gods and they ended up. Uh, you know, breaking God's commandments. Uh, we can see how uh, other nations came in and, and just plundered them and took them into captivity and, and you know, and, and things of that nature. So when we do see uh, terms like this saying that uh, this will be an everlasting possession or, um, you know, like these things will happen forever, but it was contingent upon how the people of Israel acted in the land. Uh, so in your understanding, does this only pertain to Israel? Or does it pertain to Ishmael? Does it pertain to Midian, etc.? Like the, the other the other uh, heritages and lineages from Abraham? Uh, no, this because the covenant is, is going to be kept. See, the, the people of Israel were going to come. Well, actually, not just the people of Israel, but if you talk about Christ, if you're talking about the promise of Abraham, of Abraham's seed, which is Christ, he comes through the lineage of Isaac. So that's who God has kept his covenant with. But you also have to remember that Ishmael was going to be made into a great nation as well. Um, let me see. That is down here. Uh, let me see. But just, just so I understand, you're saying Ishmael's not part of this land covenant, even though he's 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 part of Abraham's seed and he's here getting he's here he's here getting circumcised. Yeah, correct. He's not he the, the covenant is not coming through him. It's coming through Isaac. Um, I'm, oh, OK, real quick. So yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about Genesis 12 here because you because I, I saw where like so you I, I see where you kind of you're kind of melding like Genesis 12 and Genesis 17 together to where like this whole like this uh this promise given to where like all the nations of the earth we bless through you. Right. Like, I'm hearing you saying that's Christ. This has nothing to do with that as I read it. Right. So. And is, is you understand it, do both have are, are they both like the same the same chapter or are they both the same concept or is the covenant separate from the promise here because there, there's a covenant of yeah, certain now, and then there's then there's the the promise given to uh, about the nations and whatnot right okay so the covenants about the land uh about the land in which the people of israel will possess that was a covenant that god made between uh the people of israel and himself you know just like i explained earlier especially when you get to get into like deuteronomy leviticus and exodus right mm -hmm. you know when you start to read those books uh you will see where god is telling the people of israel hey listen i'm about to put you in this land you know uh, because the people of israel had been uh nomads you know um until until the time of Moses. So they were just basically people who were just traveling. They didn't have their own land. So therefore, um, and even Abraham at the time didn't even have um, a, a nation or, or a country that, that he was a part of. He was basically a traveler. So therefore, God was telling him that you're, that I'm going to make a nation out of your people, right, which is the land of Israel, which we see today. And he said that I was going to I'm going to give you I'm going to give your people, your offspring, that land to possess so they can so it can just be me, God and the people. You know, it's I'm going to govern them. Uh -huh. That was the covenant that God made concerning the land to the people of Israel. But there was also contingencies about him blessing the people in that land and them keeping it. You see what I'm saying? So, so is that near Genesis 17 or no? Because I'm 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 completely confused because as I read the scrolls, there's right. there's there's a covenant given here to Abraham. Like uh -huh. there's no mosaic right. covenant anywhere in sight in like in Correct. this higher book of Genesis, right? Right. So 
how that's what I'm, I'm I'm missing how you linked it too. Like so, everything you read early when you talk about Mosaic coming, it got you. All that lines up perfect. Gotcha. Okay. But I'm missing the link of how how of how we we jump from Genesis 17 to Exodus like 20. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. No. Well, the reason why I brought that up because you asked me about um, the promises to the land. Now, mm -hmm. what I was saying was that yes, there was a covenant made between God and the people of Israel concerning mm -hmm. the land. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But the overall promise, like what I, you know, when I did my video about um, uh, um, about the multitude or or Israel not or the church not replacing Israel, mm -hmm. basically that it was always a part of God's plan. That's totally different, and it's a separate conversation from the people of Israel in the land. So the overall, because the Bible is not, and I and I want to put this out here because I want to make sure that uh, people don't, you know, misinterpret what I say or I don't end up confusing people. Right. Um, the Bible is not about a group of people. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's be let's be clear on that for everybody that's watching. The Bible is not about a certain group of people. It's not a history book for for Israel. That's not what it is. The Bible is about. God's relationship with mankind of how man, how he made man and he made the earth perfect. Man transgressed. When man transgressed, he brought sin and death into the world. So therefore, God, through his sovereignty, has provided a sacrifice, which is Jesus Christ, which reconciles man back to God, back to the way that he had the earth. And God is going to restore the earth through the blood of Jesus Christ, the way that he had it at the beginning when he created man mm -hmm. so that's what the bible is about now everything else about um israel and the nation and all of that stuff those are things that the, the bible explains those things of how that led up to how we got to jesus christ but the bible never was supposed to be a focus on israel you see what i'm saying and that's why even in the new testament it's cleared up book after chapter after verse, you know, it's cleared up that it was never always about Israel. It was always about God's relationship with man. Okay. Let me ask my question like this. Cause, cause I think I'm not communicating where I'm being confused. Gotcha. So, so let me try, let me try to see if I, I, I can ask a better question. Okay, go ahead. So I believe, I believe early you talked about there being the, the, the righteous remnant consists mm -hmm. of, of Israelites and Gentiles. Gentiles, correct? Mm -hmm. So I'm seeing in Genesis 17 a specific um, covenant given to Abraham, not mm -hmm. not the Israelites per se, because the Israelites don't even exist yet. Right. But right. Abraham, right. Um, so if I'm one of the righteous uh, remnant of, of Israelites at the end times or whatnot, why what verse stipulates that I don't get any part of the covenant, the land covenant given to Abraham? Bump the 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 the, the Israelites of the Mosaic Covenant, like because that's a that's that's a dead law in your concept, right? So right. so if I'm a righteous remnant Israelite, how come I don't get any kind of land land ties with with the Abrahamic covenant? Well, because in the end end of times, when when Jesus comes back and he establishes his kingdom on earth, there isn't going to be a separate land from for Israel. There isn't going to be Israel and then everybody else. Uh, you know, on the oh. planet when Christ establishes his kingdom, you know, it's going to be Christ. And then there's going to be us as human beings. That's it. There isn't going to be um, a nation of Israel over here and a nation of Gentiles over there. But we're still all under Christ. There isn't going to be any separation. It's going to be Christ and his kingdom and then us living amongst Christ. And it's just going to be just like how it was with the people of Israel in the land. It was just. At first, it was just God and then the people of Israel. That's how it is going to be when Christ returned to establish his kingdom. It's just going to be us and then Christ. Okay, so uh, just so I'm clear, I'm, I'm going to ask two questions to clarify. So first mm -hmm. question, so you're saying that there is no autonomous Israel in the new kingdom, correct? No, there isn't. Okay, so is there any other autonomous nation at all? Like, so is there like a is there America? Is there Canada? Is there Australia? Or are they all gone? And then it's all just the kingdom of Jesus? Yeah, it's all gonna be that none of that is even gonna exist in a new kingdom. There isn't gonna be any uh uh nations that are, that have been built by man. You know, even when you look at Daniel's dream when he was um 
uh, I think it was Nebuchadnezzar he was talking to. Mm -hmm. um, and Nebuchadnezzar had that dream about the great statue. And then he, Daniel broke it down to him. And he was just like, you know, you're going to have the head of gold, you know, which is the Babylonian Empire. And he was basically telling Nebuchadnezzar, you are uh, the king of the greatest nation that is on earth. And historically, the nation of Babylon has been the greatest nation on the planet bar none you know there'll never be a, a nation established by man like the babylonian nation and then you had the chest that was made of uh, the chest that was made of silver right and i think that that was the persians if i'm not mistaken i think the persians came after the babylonians and then you had the waist that was made of bronze and then you had that was the Greeks, and then you had the legs that was made of iron, which was the Roman uh, Empire, and then you had the feet that was mixed with clay and iron, and then Daniel dream. I mean, I'm sorry, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed that there was this rock that had came out of heaven that was not cut by human hands, and it smashed the feet of the statue, and the statue basically just crumbled, fell into you know a million pieces, like the Bible says it. It basically went into dust like shat, like chaff. And from that rock, it became uh it grew into a great mountain which covered the earth. You see what I'm saying? So, and that was a symbolization of Christ's kingdom, you know, Christ being that rock that is going to supersede all of those nations, and that is going to be um, if I can. Uh, a destruction of those nations, right? Those nations are going to become obsolete. The only nation that's going to um, be relevant is Christ's kingdom. So in, in this kingdom, where will the new Jerusalem be established and where will the temple be? Uh, I don't think that there is going to be uh, a new temple. Um, I mean, like I said, the, the earth is going to be made new. There, there's not going to be uh, a reason for a temple and a reason for a sacrifices or anything like that. Um, just like that there was no temple and, and, and there was no uh, specific city or anything like that when God made Adam and Eve. You know, all of that stuff didn't come about until um, after the fall. So in this new kingdom, there isn't going to be um, separate people groups. It's just going to be Christ and his people. And we're going to inherit the earth. You see what I'm saying? Um, so in Revelation seven, I do believe there's there's a, a, a concept of like uh, the hundred forty four thousand being sealed and then like the nations also being called. And then like uh, the concept of them wearing white, ro white robes, et cetera, whatnot. And it being described mm -hmm. as them them doing service in the temple. So is is that not how you see it or how, how should I understand Revelation seven from your understanding? Oh, let me see. Because uh, I'm in Revelation 7 right now I'm trying to see What verse are you uh, Referring to Hold on, give me a second uh, Okay Yeah, 7, 7, uh, 15 7, 15, okay Therefore, don't Okay, okay. Right. So this is this is where um, I'm going to go ahead and start at verse seven. OK. All right. So verse seven. I mean, I'm sorry. Verse nine. I'm going to start at verse nine. OK. Right. And this is right after all of the, you know, ones to forty four thousand who are who are sealed. Now, I don't think that anybody um, I don't know who the. 144,000 who are sealed. Um, and I know a lot of people can try to play the guessing game, but I don't think that the Bible is specific on who exactly are the 144,000 who are sealed. I don't know if that's uh, people who are living today or people who have already died. But anyway, not to try to get too much off the subject. But we oh, start at Revelation. Real quick, real quick on that. Yeah, people, go ahead, go ahead. Well, people want to know, uh, do you think that the 144,000 are Israelites or, or not? Yeah, these were people. Uh, it says from every tribe, from the sons of Israel. So, so you yeah, I think that's literal Israel, just to make sure. Yeah, that okay. that would be literal Israel. Okay, yeah. okay. I, I believe that. Okay. All right. So we start at Revelation seven and nine. It says, "After this, I looked and behold, a great multitude that no one can number, 
from every nation, from all tribes, all peoples and languages standing before the throne and before the lamb clothed in white robes with palm, with palm branches in their hands. So, I mean, we already see this whole ideology about this being Israel um, that's already cleared up. It's saying that there's a great multitude that no one can number from every nation, not just one nation Israel, from all tribes mm -hmm. and peoples and languages. You see what I'm saying? It says, and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders, the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power uh, and might uh, be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Right. So we see that there is a great multitude of people. Um, and it is not just a certain group. It's not just Israel. Okay. Yeah. So, so that's basically it. So you, so you brought up. My question was about verse fifteen about the temples. Like, so you, so you said that there is going to be no temple, and I'm saying, how, how do you reconcile that with verse fifteen, where it talks about there is going to be a temple of some sort? Well, well, it's not going to be a temple that we think of, right? You know, not not a temple as in you know you're going to have some high priest go in and um uh and be you know out offering sacrifices and stuff because you got to remember the sacrificial system then comes to after the fall. So the temple that uh hold on one second let me see if I can I'm gonna I'm gonna see if I can pull it up uh hold on one second but yeah we're not talking about a temple Uh, of what we would think of with animal sacrifices and high priests. So this will be a different temple. So, okay, so what, right. what, what, yeah, I'm, I'm not talking about sacrificial systems or mosaic law or anything like that, right. Right? but it does say temple of some sort, right? So mm -hmm. in, in your in your paradigm, what is that temple? What is it? What does it look like? How does it function? Is it literal? Is it figurative? Break it down for us. Well, when it comes to, um, when it comes to a, to a lot of things in Revelation, um, it's th there's not really too much of an explanation of what that temple is going to look like. Of you know, if there's going to be a sacrifice, a sacrificial system, and all of that. But as we hold on one second, uh, I'm trying to see if I can pull it up. I had a scripture up for that. Okay, so even if we go, so when we go back to Hebrews 8 and 1, right? Okay. And we can see what the temple on earth was versus the the, uh, the temple that is in heaven. Okay. All right. And I'm reading for the ESV version, so mine is probably going to read a little bit different because I, I see the shirt you're reading it, the, the KJV. You got you right. Uh, huh? You got you right here. Boom. Okay. ESV. All right. Now the point of what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest, one who was seated, seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister in the holy places in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. So we're already seeing that there's a different distinction between the temple that is on earth that was set up by men and God's temple that is set up in heaven by him. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. Thus, it is necessary for this priest um, also to have something to offer. Now, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. They serve a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God, saying, See that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown to you on the mountain. But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is uh, as much more excellent than the old covenant. He mediates uh, as the old covenant. Uh, he mediates is better since it is uh, enacted on better promises. Right. Right. So since none of us have been to heaven and none of us have and no one has actually seen 
except for John, who was there in uh, who was there at the time in Revelation. Um, no one has seen this heavenly temple. No one has seen God's throne that God sits on. You know, like we don't know what it is, but we know that it has it's not going to look like anything that we've seen on Earth and it's not going to operate um, the same way that it did on Earth. OK, mm -hmm. so just so I can understand, is this temple in Revelation 715, is that um, is that in heaven or is that on Earth in your understanding? No, this is going to be in heaven. So Revel Revelation 17 is happening in heaven in, in, in your paradigm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So is is the rest of Revelation happening in heaven from then on, or is there anything happening in earth? Well, I mean, when, when God starts to pour his wrath out on the earth, then, you know, we will see certain things that are happening, like um, the two guys who are um, uh, the, the two witnesses who are yeah. killed, right, and, and they're left uh, on the street for three days and then they rise. Um, of course, that's stuff like that is happening on earth, but you know, uh, but Revelation 7, this is John, um, actually in heaven, right? So he's saying all he's in heaven and he's witnessing all of these things, uh, that the angel, you know, took him from earth and brought him to heaven to witness these things. So he's looking at these things, these future things that are to come, but in real time, his time. You know what I'm saying? So he's seeing all of these things happen, which haven't happened yet for us. Because we haven't seen it yet. It's taken place, but basically John had a firsthand look of what's going to happen in the end times or what God's kingdom is going to look, look like in the end times. And that's how he was able to write this in Revelation, in the book of Revelation, so that we today can actually read that and get somewhat of an understanding of what is going to happen. Now, trying to figure out what the kingdom is going to look like, and you know, um, you know, who's going to be doing what. All of that stuff is irrelevant because this is talking about Christ's return. This is leading up to Christ's return in the eleventh hour. You know, so that's that's the way uh, Revelation is basically viewed. So you, you know, and, and I want to put this out here. Because I think that a lot of times people get so wrapped up in eschatology and they're trying to figure out who's going to be doing who and who's going to be doing what. They mm -hmm. missed the point about these are the things that are going to take place as Christ is returning. These are the signs. These are this is kind of like a heads up for us to be looking towards when, when we see Christ, you know, like we're waiting Christ. We're not waiting to see who's going to be higher than the next person in heaven because that's that's not in scripture. There's not going to be a hierarchy in heaven. It's going to be God. Um, it's going to be Christ and his people that is going to be on the new earth. So is, is Revelation 22 in heaven or on earth for you in your paradigm? Uh, Revelation 22 would be the very last chapter. new earth. So that's that's physically on earth, right? Yeah, that will be that will be a new earth that is made that uh, Christ has established. Yes. Okay. Interesting. Um, so, with Revelation seven, are you familiar with this correlation to Isaiah forty nine? Uh, let me see. Uh, no, but go ahead and, and uh, so, let me see. Yeah, so Revelation 7, it talks about um, here where it says, like, they shall they shall no more hunger, neither thirst anymore. The sun shall not strike them, nor any uh, scorching heat, etc. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to spring of living waters, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, etc. Um, so, so we can find that. Hold on. That's Isaiah 47? 49. 49. So I'm sure, and then with Israelites, you've, you've heard this these verses before in the sense to where you will see you're talking about 48, uh, yeah. 49, um, 48. yeah i'm gonna read a few of them yeah that says the lord right. in a time of favor i have answered you i'm gonna read it in my version real quick mm -hmm. bam yeah 
pardon me for the these and nows, but I'm a sucker for that stuff. Thus saith the Lord, in an acceptable time have I heard thee, and in a day of salvation have I helped thee, and will, will preserve thee, and give thee for a covenant of the people to establish the earth to cause to inherit the desolate, desolate heritages. Mm -hmm. That thou mayest say to the prisoners, go forth to, uh, to them that are in darkness, show yourselves, they shall feed in the ways, and, and their pastures shall be in, the, in all the high places. They shall not hunger nor thirst, neither shall the, 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 shall the, the heat nor, nor sun smite them. Uh, for he that hath mercy on them shall lead them away. Even by the springs of water shall he guide them. It's the same. The same thing is what it's saying in Revelation. And I will make, uh, and I will make uh, all my mountains away, and my highways uh, shall be exalted. Um, I believe if I keep going, you will even see. Um, oh, not here. It's in Isaiah forty-two, where it talks about where it talks about being made a covenant, or not a covenant, but a but a light to the Gentiles. Um, mm -hmm. But it does say here. Thus saith the Lord God, behold, I will lift up mine hand to the Gentiles and set up my standard to the people, and they shall bring thy sons in their arms, and thy daughters shall be carried upon their shoulders, and kings shall be thy nursing fathers, and their queens thy nursing mothers. They shall bow down to thee with their face toward the earth, and lick up the dust of thy feet, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord, for they shall not be ashamed that wait for me. So real quick, correlate that for me with how, how you're talking about uh, Revelation 7 and, and uh, the rest of Revelation. Because as I'm reading this, um, Revelation 7 is happening on earth where, where the, the, the children of Israel are actually getting gathered back and the Gentiles are bringing them back home. Right? Yeah, no, that's not that that's not happening. Uh, Revelation 7 is not. Let me see if I can go back to it. Revelation 7 is not happening on earth. And I'm going to go ahead. Let me see. Let me go back. Okay, hold on one second. Okay. Uh, let me think. Okay. You want to bring up a screen? Uh, yeah, we, we can bring it up. Okay, so I am starting at, and I think I think I'm in the right spot. Um, okay, here we go. Yeah, Revelation four, right? Um, can Can you see my screen? Yeah, here we go. Okay, no problem. All right, so we yep. see Revelation four it says uh, the throne in heaven. Uh, so after this, I look and behold a door standing open in heaven and the first voice, which I heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, uh, come up here and I will show you what, may, what, what must take place after this. So we can already see that John is in heaven right now. Right. At once I was in the spirit and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. So he's there in heaven witnessing this. So then that's when you go into chapter five chapter six and then you see in chapter seven he's still there you know um all the way out to uh revelation 22 so he's there and he's seeing these things uh from heaven he's not on the earth and revelation seven is what he's witnessing of the people who are in heaven at that time not people who are on earth gathering uh gentiles or and gathering um, other Israelites to uh, uh, be with the Lord. These are things that are, these are people that are already there in heaven. Okay. Um, in your paradigm, is Isaiah 49 also in heaven or is that on earth? Uh, Isaiah 49. Let me go back to that because I, I like to read stuff in this context. Because mm -hmm. uh, it, literally, it literally takes verses like, so Revelation 7 quotes Isaiah 49. When it talks about like neither shall they thirst anymore, etc. Like there's a couple of verses that are directly quotes from Isaiah 49. Hence, right, the, hence the question: Is that happening on Earth or is that happening in heaven? Hold on. Uh, let me. You says Isaiah 49. Yes, sir. Okay. Let me go back. All right. Uh, and I was. I think that was verse. I was verse eight, right? Uh, hold on. I think that. Yeah, was verse ten down. specifically. Verse ten. Okay. Verse nine to ten specifically, I believe. Okay. Well, let, let, let me go ahead and read um, at the beginning. Sure. So we can try to get some type of context. 
Uh, okay, here we go. Go back up. Make sure I don't lose my spot. <laughs> oh, here we go. Okay, all right. Uh, thus says the Lord, in the time of favor, I have answered you. In the day of salvation, I have helped you. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people to establish uh, in the land uh, to apportion the desolate uh, heritage, saying to the prisoners, come out to those who are in darkness. Appear, they shall feed along the ways uh, on all bare heights shall be their pasture. They shall not hunger or thirst, neither scorching wind nor sun shall strike them. For he who has pity on them, he will lead them, and by signs of water, he will guide them. So you're saying that Isaiah 49 and 10 is what's being referenced in um, Revelation 7? Yes, sir. Okay, let me go back to Revelation 7. Revelation 7 and 16. Okay. Uh, let me see what the footnote says. Uh, yeah, I mean, to be honest, I mean, I don't uh, I don't know if that is happening on Earth, but what I can say is that maybe in this Revelation, is, right, real quick yeah. in Revelation or Isaiah, you're not sure if it's happening on Earth or not. No, no, no. Uh, um, in in uh, Revelation. Uh, no, actually, no. I'm sorry. Isaiah. OK. But in Revelation, uh, we can clearly see that this is a quote from uh, from Isaiah. Right. But this is in reference to. You know, and that's why a lot of times I like to try to like read in context because even when we go up to verse 14, mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry, verse 13, then one of the elders addressed me saying, who are these clothed in white robes and from where have they come? So where did these people come from who are already clothed in white robes? So these are not people that's on earth. And he said, and I said to him, sir, you know, and he said to me, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have wasted, they have washed their robes and made them white in the, in the, um, in the blood of the lamb. So these are people that are, that are dead. They're in heaven. They're not, they're, they're no more on earth. So okay. then therefore, then that's when you go into 15 and then it quotes Isaiah of the people, um, uh, the people who were on earth, who were carrying out what was in Isaiah 49 at the time. But these are the people that Isaiah 49 were talking about. So they're now, so when we look at revelation seven, they're now in heaven. They are. Th this is what this is what the elders are um, telling him, t telling John. They're asking him basically a rhetorical question, like, "Who are these guys? You know, who are these people that's dressed in these robes that um, the multitude that no one can can number, the great multitude uh, from every tribe, tongue, and nation? These are the people that were referenced in Isaiah forty nine. So they're now in heaven at that time." So when you go back again to Revelation 7 and 15, it quotes Isaiah 49 okay. to let you know that these are the people that were talked about at that time. Okay, so in Isaiah 49, it says a couple things I want to touch on just, just, to, I, I, just so I can make sure I'm clear on your perception on it. Yeah, so go ahead. in Isaiah 49 and 8, it talks about the concept of being a covenant to the people. Uh it also says the same thing in Isaiah 42, where it talks about where it talks about the Israel being a light to the Gentiles, but also being made a covenant to the people. And your paradigm, what does that mean, and what does that look like? Israel as a nation being made a covenant for the people. You said, or, or does it even pertain to Israel as a nation? You said Isaiah 49 and 8. Yeah, and also 40 Isaiah 42, and I believe six. Okay. Oh, let me see. Now, for Isaiah forty nine, uh, and for uh, Isaiah forty nine, starting at verse eight, is basically kind of like a precursor. Because once you read that, because if you just take that scripture out of its, uh, you know, like out of its context, and you're not really reading the the uh, uh, the entire context of Isaiah, like anybody can take that and say, well, this, you know, this means that this is going strictly for Israel and no one else. But then by the time you get to Isaiah 52, even when you start in Isaiah one, um, and I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna start there. 
even when you saw that at Isaiah 1, and I'm going to see if I can share my screen, so you guys can kind of get the gist of what I'm saying, mm -hmm. so it doesn't seem like I'm just rambling uh, for no reason. But if we start at Isaiah 1... You can make it just a little bit bigger. A little bit bigger? Yeah, just a little bit. Is that better? Yeah, that's better. All right, so even when we start... I mean, we can start at, at, at verse 1, uh, or we can read at the top where it says the wickedness of Judah, right? When we're reading in context, even when you look down at Isaiah 1 and 13, where God says, bring me no more vain offerings, incense is an abomination to me, new moon the Sabbath, and a calling of convocations. I cannot endure iniquity and solemn uh, assembly. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I'm weary of them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Correct oppression. Bring justice to the fatherless. Please do plead uh, the widow's case. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though your sins, uh, though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. If you are willing to be obedient, uh, if you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be eaten by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Um, and then it goes into the faithful city. The I'm um, sorry, the unfaithful city. You know how the faithful city has become a whore. She who has, uh, she who was full of justice, righteous. Righteousness lodged in her, but now murders. So we're talking about that was the current state of Israel at that time. So we can already see, starting at Isaiah 1, uh, God is not pleased with Israel. So to kind of go all the way to Isaiah 49 and to be like, well, you know, um, now we're supposed to be looking at Israel because this is, you know, like somehow Israel is going to play a big part in, in people's salvation. I don't see that starting at Isaiah 1. I don't see where God is happy with Israel. He's telling them to stop offering sacrifices in his name, to stop doing Sabbaths and, and, um, and festivals and feasts. He calls that an abomination. He's telling the people of Israel to stop doing that. I hate that stuff. So if God has already told them in Isaiah 1 to stop doing that, then why are we still looking to Israel when they're telling you know, people like us that we need to continue to keep the Sabbath and, you know, the feasts and the festivals and all of that stuff. You see what I'm saying? But that's kind of a side, that's kind of a side conversation. But when we read a couple of chapters after Isaiah, uh, um, after Isaiah 49, then by the time we get to Isaiah 53, then now we're talking about Christ. We're talking about uh, uh, the Messiah, the suffering Messiah, right? Who's going to be transgress, who's going to be punished for our transgressions. Um, and that starts at the end of Isaiah 52, but then it kind of segues into Isaiah 53. So it has nothing to do. So that's why, like, even when people pick and choose out of certain verses in Isaiah, I'm like, unless you read Isaiah in its proper context, you can pick whatever scripture you want and try to make it fit a narrative. But once you read the whole uh, uh, book of Isaiah in its context, then we can see that it still turns around and points right back to Christ and his completed work on the cross. It never points at Israel. Israel was just a blip in time, but the Bible in its entirety was about Christ, about how God redeemed man uh, through the blood of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, right? Our our Lord and Savior. Mm -hmm. So, um, but go ahead. But um, I see so, you got no, Isaiah 42. No, 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 so if I got you clear, the, the light for the Gentiles is Christ is what you're saying. No, the, I'm sorry. What was that? The light for the Gentiles is Christ, is from what I understand, what you're saying, correct? Oh, let me pull that up. You said it's Isaiah 42? Uh, Isaiah 42 and 6, yeah. All right. All right. Well, it would either be Christ or it would be the nation of Israel. So I'm trying to see. I'm, I'm assuming. No, you... it'll, no, it'll be Christ. Now, if you go all the way up to verse 1. Uh, it says, Behold, my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. Mm -hmm. I have put my spirit upon him. He didn't say upon them. He said upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nation. 
he will not cry out, uh, he will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. At this time, I mean, I don't read three verses already, and we still don't see anything about Israel doing this stuff. Okay, let's go down to verse four. So he just, will, just, just just so we're clear, like, so there's going to be a lot of uh, Israelites watching talking about, like, well, there's a lot of parts in Isaiah where Israel is being referred to as as the righteous, as the righteous servant. But you're saying in this instance, it's, it's not talking about Israel as a nation. It's talking about Jesus in particular, correct? Well, this is not what I'm saying. This is what the Bible is saying uh, for anyone who, who, you know, wants me to be clear. <laughs> this is what the Bible is saying. And we're reading Isaiah 42, starting at verse one. Mm -hmm. So I know a lot of people will jump straight to four, verse six. But no, let's read the first five verses, and we can see in the first five verses, it's strictly talking about God. I mean, Christ. It, it, they, it hasn't even mentioned Israel yet. So it's not Israel doing anything. This is all what God is doing through Christ. Okay. So uh, in Isaiah 49, hold on, let me go back right quick. Mm -hmm. in, Isaiah, in Isaiah 49, uh, 22, there in Isaiah 60, you're, you're talking about like, uh, like don't don't jump to the beginning, of Isaiah, get the whole context of Isaiah, right? Mm -hmm. and I'm with that. So in Isaiah 49 22, there's right. this concept of I read earlier, uh, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I will lift up mine hand to the Gentiles and set up my standard to the people, um, and they shall bring thy sons in their arms, and thy daughters shall be carried upon their shoulders. Um, there's that concept there, and if I go to Isaiah 66 and 20. Mm -hmm. It'll say a very similar thing, but even more particular in the sense that it says this. And they shall, uh, hold on, let me do like this, start at 19. And I'll set a sign among them, and I will send those that escape uh, of them unto the nations to Tarshish, Pol, and Lud, that draw the bow to Tobal and Javan to the isles afar off, that have mm -hmm. not heard my fame, neither have seen my glory, and they shall declare my glory among the Gentiles. And they shall bring all your brethren for an offering unto the Lord out of the nations upon horses and, and in chariots and in litters and upon mules and upon swift beasts to my holy mountain, Jerusalem, saith the Lord, as the children of Israel bring an offering in a clean vessel into the house of the Lord. Now, so both concepts to me seem, seem like that, like uh, the Gentiles are bringing the, the, the right strum that you were talking about back home into the into the land of Israel. It, talk, it talks about the holy mountain of Israel here, and it talks about the same holy mountain in Isaiah 49. Okay. Now, when we go all the way back up, like I said, when we read the whole chapter in its context, <laughs> we start at Isaiah 66, and we start at verse 1. That's okay. Just, that's do, you mind, do you mind if I ask my question if we get, if we, before we oh, go? Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> so real quick, my, my, my question is this. Um, so is that something that happens literally, figuratively, on earth or in heaven in your paradigm? Uh, Isaiah 66 and 22 66 and 20 yeah to where to where the, to where the Gentiles are are bringing uh where in, in Isaiah 49 it talks about like them carrying the son their, uh Israel's sons and daughters on their shoulders and then Isaiah 66 it says that they're being brought um, as an offering unto the Lord out of the nations um, is that something literal is that something figurative is that something that happens on earth is that something that happens in heaven how, how does that work in your paradigm well uh to be honest this is you know um you know, I've read through the book of Isaiah, but this is the first time I've ever heard it being, you know, these particular verses mm. being used in their con in this in this context. So that's why, you know, even with me, and that's why I said, you know, I like to go and I like to start from the top and read down because if we just start at Isaiah 66 and 20, and it says, And they shall bring all your brothers from all the nations as an offering to the Lord on horses and chariots and litters. And on music and all these other things, then I'm just like, okay, well, 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 what is he talking about? Because we can go back up to 66 and 18 where it says, For I know uh their works and their thoughts, and the time is coming together, all nations and tongues, and they shall come out and see my glory. So I'm like, Well, who is these people that he's talking about? So if you keep going up, you're gonna keep saying, Okay, well, I, I need to kind of get that in context. You know what I'm saying? So that's why I'm just real, real quick context. Let me drop down to, to yeah, go ahead. Verse 21, it says, and I will take, I will also take of them for priests and for Levites, saith the Lord. So I'm assuming, like, I'm going to say that's Israel, but we can go to whatever context you want. 
Right. So, like I said, when we start at 60, when we start at the top, yep. right, um, and, and we start at, at verse one, it says, Thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What is the uh, what is the house that you should build for me? And what is the place of my rest? All these things my hand has made. And so all things uh, came to be, declares the Lord. But this is to the uh, uh, but this is the one whom to I will look. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. Right. And it goes down. And that's why, you know, as we continue to read. We get back, we get all the way back down to, to where we say Isaiah 66 and 20. Yeah. Now, when we look at uh, 18, verse 18, uh, where it starts kind of like the new paragraph, for I know their works and their thoughts, and the times come together, all nations and tongues, and they shall come and see my glory, and I will set a sign among them, and from them I will send survivors to the nations, to Tarshish, Pul, and uh, uh, Alud, to draw the bow, to Tubal and Javan, to the crossroads far away, that have not heard my fame or seen my glory. And they shall declare my glory among the nations. And they shall bring all your brothers from the nations as an offering to the Lord on horses and in chariots and in litters on mules and uh, uh, dromedaries to my holy mountain Jerusalem, says the Lord, just as the Israelites bring their grain offering uh, in a clean vessel to the house of the Lord. And some of them also I will take for priests and for Levites, says the Lord. So we're talking about uh, these are people because if you if you read in this context it says to the coastlands far away that have not heard my fame or seen my glory so clearly we can see that these are not Israelites these are Gentiles now you have to remember this is still before Christ and what happened after the death burial and resurrection of Christ the gospel um you had about 3,000 people on the day of Pentecost that that uh converted uh, uh to to what we call Christianity, right? And those people actually went out into all of the nations, just like Jesus said, with the uh, uh the Great Commission to go out into all nations, preach the gospel, and let them know that uh, um that God is one, right? To to preach the gospel of Christ. I'm paraphrasing. Mm -hmm. So this is in context with that it's in symmetry with that it, okay. like when we go down to 66 and 20 and they shall bring all because this is basically a prophecy and they shall bring your brothers from all the nations as an offering to the lord so what brothers are we talking about we're talking about the israelites can't be the israelites because it says if you go back up to verse 19 that have not heard my fame or seen my glory so it can't be israelites because the israelites know who god is if we're going by 66 and 19, but if we jump down to down to 20, how can this be Israel when it says that and they shall bring all your brothers from the nations as an offering to the Lord on horses and chariots and litters and, and so on and so forth, right? So these are talking about uh, um, people who are the Gentiles. These are these, these are not Israelites because the Israelites know God. Okay, in, in Revelation 7, um, when there is the sealing of the 144,000 and, and the calling forth of the nations, um, where in the Old Testament can I see a, a, a pointing towards of that gathering? Is it an, And is that gathering on earth or is it in heaven? Because you were saying Revelation 7 is in heaven, but like Revelation 7 talks about like the 144,000 being sealed and the, and the nations being called together, etc. Uh-huh. All right, well, first of all, um, let me see. Uh, and and I've got mixed. Uh, I, I've heard mixed teachings on this about the, the one hundred forty-four thousand. I heard I heard so many different interpretations about it. But again, I like to just read stuff in its context. And if there is one hundred forty-four thousand, uh, I believe that these were people who are from these uh, uh from these twelve tribes. But to me, at the at the end of the day, 
I don't believe, I, I believe that this is a secondary issue and this can be up for interpretation unless it's the right interpretation, but you don't really hear too much and there's not too many uh, uh, sound teachings on who exactly the 144,000 were. I believe that these are still people that God chose uh, through his sovereign decree. Now, how he how he chose this 144,000 people, I don't know. But one thing that I can say confidently is that no one, uh, none of us here on earth can say specifically who is a part of that 144,000. And I believe that this is probably a mystery that uh, that only God knows. And um, and if he reveals it to us and if he has revealed it to us, great. But I can basically say that I don't think that anyone on earth has a confidence or, or has um has the knowledge to know exactly who are the 144,000 and at mm -hmm. the same time I don't believe that it's 144,000 it still doesn't play a role in salvation you know what I'm saying so when it comes to salvation these 144,000 people are still irrelevant you know um we're, we're not looking to these 144,000 for salvation you know like these are just 144,000 people who have been sealed Okay, I got maybe one or two more questions that I'm going to open up to the chat uh, mm -hmm. to, to jump on. Uh, the, the the link is in the chat. Mackie, yeah, I saw you jump in and out. Feel free to, to jump back on, brother man. I'm going to open this up real soon, just in a couple minutes. Um, I just want a clarification on just a couple more questions. Yeah, so um, here we see it says that, and some of them also I will take for priests and for Levites, says the Lord. And if I go to Malachi 3, um, as I was talking with Elder Mike, there is also this narrative in Malachi three about the the Levites being refined and offering offerings, um, free will offerings, is how, how it says in Hebrew. You know what I'm saying, um, but they're offering offerings to the Lord, um, and the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem are are uh, accepted and pleasing. Um, and there's there's a, a bringing forth the tithe, etc. So in your in your paradigm, uh, how did how does this work? Is, is there any Levites in your paradigm at all? Are they done and gone away with? Um, are they purified? Are they refined? What's the deal for them? Okay, uh, Malachi, I'm looking at three and three. He will sit as a refiner. Hold on, let me pull that up. Yeah, we can go for, We can go from verse one, right, where it says, uh, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me, and mm -hmm. the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger mm -hmm. of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. Mm -hmm. uh, but who can endure the day of his coming and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like a like fuller's soap. He yep. will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver. And they will bring offerings and righteousness to the Lord. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old uh, uh, and as in former years. Uh, then will I draw near to you for judgment. I will be a swifter witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against those who swear falsely, against those who oppress the hired worker in his wages, the widow and the fatherless, against those who thrust aside the sojourner. And do not fear me, say the Lord's of hosts. Um, it says, for I, the Lord, do not change their, therefore. Uh, right. therefore uh, oh, children of Jacob are, are not consumed for the, et cetera. Let me jump down to where it talks about the time. Yeah, go ahead. And it says, you are... Uh, Will a man rob God? You are robbing God, uh, yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you in your tithes and, con and contributions? Mm -hmm. uh, you are cursed with a cursed, uh, cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm assuming that's talking about Israel here, Malachi 3, but I don't know how you take that. Um, yeah, no. Yeah, I believe that it is talking to, um, it, it is speaking to, uh, um, to Israel. And lastly, in 3 and 10 and 11, they get the commandment to bring forth the tithe and the storehouse, etc. And then Correct. also th that when they do such that the devourer will, the devourer will be rebuked for them, etc. Mm -hmm. So in, in, in your breakdown, um, when and how does this happen in your paradigm? And again, are, is it the nations being brought forth and being made Levites, as it says? Like, so you're saying Isaiah 60, 66 says, and 21 says that, that it's the nations being made meeting the Levites. So how, how does how does this work? Well, you know, like I said, this is my first time, uh, you know, dealing with these select scriptures, um, which that's why, like, even in my video, I talked about, you know, I tried to give a timeline. I tried to give specific scriptures, you know, chapters and verses to show that 
the Bible, you know, once again, is not about a nation of people. Like we, we're, we're not looking to Israel for anything, mm -hmm. you know, um, we're only looking to Christ. So trying to figure out who these specific people are, it's irrelevant. I think it's kind of pushing a false narrative because, you know, even when you stop and you uh, start to read Malachi 3 and 1, uh, it says, behold, I will send my messenger and he will prepare a way before me. So that is the gist of the conversation, you know, of of the um, uh, of the prophecy, right? Because he's saying that I will send my messenger. So we're looking towards the messenger. We're not trying to figure out well, who are who, who are these Levites that they mentioned and, and, and who is actually this Judah in Jerusalem? No, it says, behold, I will send my messenger and he will prepare a way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant whom you delight, uh, behold, is coming, says the Lord of hosts. So that's what we are looking towards, trying to figure out exactly who these Levites are and who's going to be a part of these Levites and if it's an ethnic thing and can we trace a bloodline back. That's irrelevant because we're looking for the messenger. We want to know who the messenger is. Okay. That's what we're looking for. We're not looking for who's actually a Levite and who's not. Mm -hmm. You know that that's that's really irrelevant. Okay, last question. I'm gonna turn it over to, to the uh, to the audience and let them jump yeah, on their the questions. Um, so just so I have you correct. So so if I if mm -hmm. I don't have you right, please let me know. I got you wrong. Yeah, um, go ahead. As I hear, hear you talk, um, uh -huh. in sixty six twenty, it's the nations coming uh, to, to to the Most High, right? Um, and in 6621, it's the, the people from the nations being made into the most highest priests. Does that make sense? Is, am I hearing that right or no? Hold on. You, you said that it's the nations that's doing what now that's being made? Being what? made in, like in 6621, and some of them uh, also I will take for priests and for Levites, say, uh, says the Lord. So I'm assuming that it's, it's the nations that you're saying becomes the new priesthood, etc. Yeah, so these would be, um, this would be, again, going back to Revelation uh seven uh back in revelation seven i think it's Re revelation seven and nine mm -hmm. this is the people that who have had their robes washed clean they're all in white robes yeah. they're in heaven that these okay. are these are the people that that are being talked about you see what i'm saying so these are the people who have washed their robes clean with the blood of christ so how do you get your robes washed clean through the blood of christ so how do we wash our, how do we get to that point? Put our faith and trust in Christ. Mm -hmm. Again, once again, trying to figure out, well, well, who are these Levites, right? Well, well who are these real Israelites? Who, who, who are these folks? Doesn't matter. And I, again, we can go back up Isaiah 66 and, um, and we can go back up to 66 and two. But this is the one to whom I will look. He who was humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. I mean that's that that's who the people are. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's not a nation, it's not people who can identify as a Levite, as an Israelite, whatever. It doesn't matter. It says, but this is to the one whom I will look, he who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. And that's cleared up throughout the New Testament. That's what's up. Well, I very much appreciate you sitting through my questions and help me uh, helping me gain understanding as to where you sit on certain things. Um it, it definitely cleared a lot of things up for me because if I like if I heard you um, the first if I just heard you like one or two times I would have assumed a few things about you but I think this conversation helped me get clarity as to where you're different from a lot of other people um, so I definitely yeah. appreciate you coming through and clarifying <laughs> I, I I definitely appreciate you having me on you know um, you know I I do like having discussions like this mm -hmm. and uh, you know and, and I'm a weird I'm I'm a weirdo I, I do like being challenged on my faith because. Sometimes I've had to go back and be like, okay, you know, this was said. Let me go back and read this and make sure that what I said was correct. You know what I'm saying? But because, like I said, this is the first time that I've ever had uh, a lot of these these certain scriptures mm -hmm. um, taken and basically thrown at me. Um, you know, of, of course, and you know, with all due respect, out of its context. Because anybody can just take con you know scriptures and just throw them throw them at you and say, well, see, it says this and this here, but then when I'm just like, okay, well, no, I I know I've read through the book of Isaiah, but let's actually go back and let's read from the top and see 
what the beginning of the conversation was about. It's just like, for instance, mm -hmm. like we're having this conversation now. If somebody came in right now during this conversation, they could say, hey, I believe that um, Alton is a Hebrew Israelite. You know what I'm saying? He's a Hebrew Israelite because he's reading from the book of Isaiah and all of that. But if you didn't catch the beginning of this live stream, then you wouldn't know where I stood unless you actually started watching this live stream now and stayed until the end. But if you watch five, right. So if you watch five minutes of it right now and then you left and then came back 20 minutes later and then listened to a little bit more and then you kept coming back and coming back in, you know, you're not going to understand what the full context of what this discussion is about. So that's why we can't treat the Bible the same way. We have to understand what is the basis? What is the base message of the Bible? Mm -hmm. And when we read the Bible, especially when we read the first three chapters of Genesis, it has nothing to do with a certain nation of people. You know, it doesn't. That nation of people, and I thank God for the nation of Israel. I'm talking about the ancient Israelites and what they did about bringing the Messiah. But that's where it stops for me because my main focus is on the Messiah, you know, and I thank God and his sovereignty for being able to open my eyes and for us to be able to have his word, you know, like this is his word from the beginning. He's letting us know exactly everything of how it happened from the beginning and what's going to take place even in the end times. And I just thank God that I'm alive today to where I can, that I have access and I'm living in the country to where I have access this this uh this information is just readily available for me to actually read it and actually study it and go through it myself. Um and that you know, as believers, no whether you know whether you call yourself an Israelite or you call yourself a Christian, you know, the most loving thing that you can do, and if especially if you claim that you love God, is to pick up this book and to actually read through it and to take and to just take the blinders off and just pray and say, Lord, as I read this book, as I read this Bible, please open my eyes and give me understanding to what your word says. And that's how you have to approach the Bible. If you go into it with this um, with this presupposition that it's about a certain people and then you're trying to identify as that certain people, you're totally good. You're going to mess the scriptures up and you're not going to get it. Okay. Well, yeah, definitely no offense taken. Um, uh, it's always understood that uh, I'm going to have a, a difference of opinion in terms of belief system with almost everybody I bring on. But uh, yeah. that's actually one of the reasons why why we do this, so we can understand where people are coming from. So right. um, if you want to come on another time, in, in a, I, I'll definitely, I, if you want to, I can email you all the verses that I was talking about. Um, okay. If you want to come back and address those verses with, with a bit more study, et cetera, whatnot, and more specificity, we can definitely have that conversation. Yeah, um, we like, that. I, want, I want people to be clear on what you're saying on it. And if you were, if you were kind of caught off guard or hadn't used to like, it's not, it's not fair to people. To, like people can take that and run with it. You know what I'm saying? So, <laughs> right. If, if you want right. to come back and clarify that, no issues. Um, um, we, I mean, maybe we can, you know, ha have another discussion about that. Um, but I don't think that I was re like really caught off guard to where I'm just like, Oh wait, hold on. Let me, uh, you know, <laughs> the, the, let me try to go back and study this stuff because I might be wrong. No, it's like I understand what the Bible is about. I understand the, the, the Bible mm -hmm. message. Um, but, you know, the, the problem comes is when people take pieces of scripture and they're trying to fulfill a narrative. They're trying to push a narrative. That's where the problem comes in because you're trying to say that the scriptures is about you and a certain group of people when it's totally that's totally against scripture you know the the, the scripture is about christ and his completed work on the cross from genesis to revelation that's what it's about god establishing that relationship between him and man i mean not some group of people you know that, that's not what it's about well all righty so we got about 20 minutes left in the broadcast and we got right. two people on the panel uh we have brother mackie who's been waiting for quite some time so i'm gonna let him go first then we have brother so real coming on after that yes um, sir uh, so mac you can definitely come in and uh and ask some of your questions and introduce yourself if you want to but there, uh, just so we're clear there is no ad hominems there is no swearing no name calling none of that this is a respectful uh, build and dialogue back and forth on all sides um, so with that you have the floor mackie 
who uh can, can I be heard? Yes, sir. All right. Um I I don't think it's necessary for me to introduce myself on anything, I'm nothing special. Uh just got some questions pertaining to the scriptures. All right. Uh, could you explain uh to me and to the audience what a covenant is and how it works in the biblical narrative? Well, the covenant, you know, like I said earlier, you know, in, in layman's terms, is basically like a contract, right? A contract of, uh, uh, of God basically promising something to a certain person or a certain group of people uh, under certain circumstances and at certain times, you know, and that's what a covenant is. So therefore, that's why when we read each covenant, uh, we have to read each covenant in its context to understand who was it for and at what time period was it given. You know what I'm saying? So that's what basically a covenant is. Um, and covenants can be broken, just like I read it in, in Hebrews 8. You know, um, and actually we, we were reading some verses in Isaiah where uh, the people of Israel had broken the covenant, had broken God's covenant. So therefore he punished the nation. So that's just basically what it is. It's it's a um uh, excuse me, it is a contract. Okay, cool. With that being said, uh since it is a contract um between uh the uh parties involved, can mm -hmm. the uh can the contract um by the person who made it is both parties responsible for fulfilling the terms of the contract? Yes. So, according to that uh, that paradigm, then mm -hmm. did the Most High fulfill his part of the contract that he made with Abraham? Yes. How? You're talking about the pro um, um, as in the promises of making Israel. I'm sorry, of making um, Abraham the father of many nations? Is that what you're talking about? No. Because he did do that. No, 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 no. It says that it says that he will multiply his seed mm -hmm. to be the stars of the heaven and the sand of the sea. Mm -hmm. And that he said that they would be uh, um, that through him all the nations of the earth should be blessed. Mm -hmm. So when he's when he's using that that narrative there, He's talking about not uh, he's talking about through him, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. That means that his descendants would cause the earth would cause the nations of the earth to have a blessing from the most high because they obey the voice that Abraham gave. They obey, excuse me, they obey the voice of the most high that Abraham gave to his descendants. Uh, I, I'm, I'm trying to follow you. So. I'm I'm trying to see where you're going with this. Are you are you trying to say that that wasn't fulfilled, or um, I'm trying I'm trying to see exactly like like where you're going with this. Are you trying to say that 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 God didn't fulfill that, or God has yet to fulfill that to to bless? Uh, go ahead. I'm saying that you already said that the that Yashara was not a light unto the nations, which is not true. Because when Solomon was reigning in righteousness, when David was reigning in righteousness, when mm -hmm. all when Yahshua was reigning in righteousness, there were things that the nations could not do to them because they were in righteousness. And on top of that, the nations themselves submitted to Yahshua as a great nation, uh, i.e. Uh, uh, Solomon and Hezekiah, when they were in righteousness. The nations submitted themselves unto them and gave them gifts because they were a righteous people and because they followed after the most high. Okay. So what does that have to do with the people of today? What does, what does that have to do with Christ's completed work on the cross today? Well, it has everything to do with it because what you're saying is, is that the nation of Yahshua would never be a light. Is uh, That the nation of Yahshua is not a light even though Mashiach is coming for that, even though Mashiach said that they were. No, the, the nation of Israel that, that 
that you're talking about um, the the ancient um, nation of Israel even now. Let's just talk about the nation of Israel now. Do you think that 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 land over there in the Middle East that is called Israel? Do you think that those people are alike to the world now? I don't believe that they're Israelites at all. So of course not. No. Why not? Because they're they're in the land. They're in Israel. Being you, uh, huh? sir, sir, in Second Kings seventeen, um, the king of Babylon put individuals who were Gentiles in the land, sir. And they stayed in that land and all they had to do, literally all they had to do was follow some of the laws of the Torah. And, and they still worship the same Elohim of their fathers, which were idols. And they were able to stay in the land just because they followed some aspects of the Torah that kept them from being destroyed by the most high. That does not make them the people of Yashorah, sir. Well, no, what I'm asking you, because you mentioned that Israel is supposed to be a light to the world and that Israel is a light to the world. So where is this Israel that, since you already said that the people over there in that land are not the people, they are not Israelites. So what what group of Israelites, the true Israelites, are we are supposed to look to as Gentiles uh, uh, to be able to carry out uh, so, so we can be blessed by God, basically, so we can have salvation? If you... This is why I brought up the, the question of what a covenant is. The reason sure. why the reason why I did that is because a covenant is based on two parties making an agreement. Right. The most high made an agreement with Abraham mm -hmm. that was a lasting covenant that no matter no matter what his descendants did, and I'm saying I'm prefacing that specifically, no matter what his descendants did, mm -hmm. the that he made unto Abraham is an everlasting covenant. It right. cannot be broken regardless of what they do because the Most High has to fulfill his bargain. That is exactly why when I showed you, when I asked you, how did he fulfill that? And you said he did. I'm asking you, how did he do it? How? Through, through the blood of Jesus Christ. Cool. Where does it say that in the covenant? Let's go ahead and let's read. Uh, I'm going to start at Matthew 26. Let me see. Uh, okay. Uh, let me see. Actually, hold on one second. I, I can go ahead and start at Matthew 26 and 26. Um, it says, now as they were eating, this is uh, during the, the, the Last Supper, but I'm going to read this first and then I'm going to basically get into what, you know, what, what the, um, uh, what I'm trying to get, I'm trying to make a point here, but now as they were eating, Jesus took bread and, um, and after blessing, I broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood, the covenant, which is poured out for many uh, for the forgiveness of sins. And I, uh, I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. So we already knew in Matthew 26 and 28, uh, Jesus said that this is my blood of the covenant. So if Jesus is God, which the Bible clearly states, um, this is God making a covenant through the blood of Christ which it says that um, is poured out for the uh, is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. So, I oh. mean, if, if you think that there's a better blessing than that, then God, um, you know, that's, forgiven our sins, then I mean, I would like to hear it. Well, that's not the point that I'm that I'm that I'm making. So what? OK. Go ahead. Hello. Yeah, Maggie just dropped out. Come back, oh, Maggie. Man. I oh, think man. I, I was trying to, I was, yeah, I, I was trying to see. Um, oh, here, you, here you go. Here you go. Okay. Go okay. Ahead, yeah, go ahead. Okay, I'm sorry. What What was that? What were you saying? You said the point that you was trying to make was what? Can you go to uh, Genesis chapter 17, please? Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, yeah, we were in that one earlier. What verse would you like, brother? Uh, the... Just go to the beginning verse where it talks about the promise. It says, okay, right there, verse four. It says, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abraham, 
I mean, Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made uh, you the father of many nations. Uh, and it says, and I will make you exceeding fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. So is this saying kings as in multiple or kings as in one? It says uh, kings as a multiple. Okay, so that, so this, this is my point. Last question. Okay. We're gonna make the next question, your last question, I'm going to bring Silver on so we can have uh, an equal 10 minutes as well before we wrap up. I'm sorry, what? This is going to be your last question because uh, uh, I, I gave you 10 minutes and I'm going to give Surreal the last 10 minutes. So all right, all right. Give me a hand up. Go ahead. So, Okay, so this this is my point. This is a promise made uh, made to by the Most High to is it is it to everybody or to his descendants? Uh, it is to his uh, descendants. Okay, if it's if it's to his descendants, then how was that promise fulfilled? If you're saying if right here there's no king right now, we know that today right now there's no kings. And we know that according to the uh, to the New Testament, where he said that he was going to make kings and priests out of a particular group. How is it fulfilled then, according to your paradigm, because you're making it about Mashiach? What I'm saying is, is that it is about Mashiach, but Mashiach fulfills a particular promise that cannot be undone. So I'm asking you, when was this fulfilled? All right. I'm going to share my screen. And we are going to go to Galatians 3 and 16. Paul clears this up. Let's go ahead and start to Galatians 3 and 16. You can see it says the law and the promise. Uh, to give a human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified. Right? Talking about the covenant. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say and to offsprings referring to many, but referring to one and to your offspring who is Christ. So I don't, you know, I mean that that directly deals with what you're saying. It says to the offspring who is Christ. All right, with that, I'm gonna bring in brother So Real. Peace and blessings. How you doing, So Real? So Real, you are muted. Can you hear me? I think he needs to unmute his mic. Yeah, so real going once. Uh, uh, ask him. Ask him if he can hear you, Alton. Hey, so real. Hey, uh, can you hear me? Because uh, uh, we can't hear you. I think your mic is muted. If if you are trying to say any, uh, say anything. Well, if he can't come in, Mackie, if you want to, you can come back, brother man, and keep keep your line of question going. Oh, man. oh, there he is. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead, Mackie. We can't hear so real, so go ahead, man. Okay, cool. Um, sir, you're 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 not you're not understanding what's going on, okay? Okay, that, go ahead. Okay. That's not related. That's not related. Galatians it's not related. It's no, it's okay. not it's talking about offsprings, it's talking about offsprings of Abraham. He had Ishmael and he had the sons of Keturah. Those never received promises, even though Ishmael became a great nation. Even though the sons of Keturah became a great nation, they never gave the actual promise of what Abraham gave to uh, to Isaac. Not one of them. It was okay. only to one, and that was Isaac. Through Isaac shall thy seed be called. That's what it was. So specifically right there, that has nothing to do with the question I'm asking pertaining to what was what Abraham, uh, what was going to come through the loins of Abraham. It said kings. What's going to come through the loins of Abraham and only people who became kings, according to Torah, according to scripture, were the children of Yasharal. And okay. through the children of Yasharal became the priests and the kings and nobody else got that promise except for them. How can you show that somebody else that's not a part of the contract, Gentiles, nations, uh, um, Greeks, Romans, how can you show? Anywhere in the Torah and in the prophets that any other nation got what was promised only to one nation of people. Okay, so again, now 
I'm going to read this again, and I want you to break this down for me since you said that I'm, I'm incorrect. Now, I'm reading the Bible. This is not me, uh, you know, trying to do some exhortation. Galatians 3 and 16, once again, now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ? Can you tell me what that means? Because you're telling me that I'm wrong when when you're referring to the promises of Abraham. And Galatians 3 and 16 cannot be any clearer about who the promises was made to and what the promise is. So since I'm wrong, can you can you please explain to me how, how am I misinterpreting that? Sure. Go to Romans 9. All right. And real quick, while you're going there, hey, so real, can, can you hear us? You should be able to now. Yep. Never hear. Sorry, I, I hit the wrong button while I was trying to, um, you know, unmute. You sound like you're underwater right quick. <laughs> oh, dang. Can, can I, you... I, no, there yeah, you go. You're a little bit better there. Oh, I'm better? Yeah, I can hear you better now. Still sound, still sound low, but you're you're a little bit better than what you were. Yeah. I might have to take these headphones off, but yeah, you, you guys can go ahead and continue. I, I just wanted to chime in and say some some ending comments, you know, about what you're talking about. That's all. Okay. So go ahead, Matthew. You go. And when you done, uh, so we'll finish off. Uh, I, I would. I just wanted to read like verses three and four, just to kind of to make my point. Mm-hmm. It said. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. They are Israelites and to them and to them, not not to everyone, to them, mm -hmm. adoption, the glory, the covenant, the giving of the law, the worship and what the promises. So nobody else could get them. It was only to them. It was given. It was only to them. It was received. And it was only to them that it can remain. Because the Most High made the covenant with one people. That's what Galatians 3 is referencing. One. Because okay. Abraham, because when you mention, again, when it's mentioning offspring, it's talking about what Abraham had. Abraham had many sons, but he only had one that was of the son of the promise that only got one thing. And that was everything that was given over to the descendants. And roughly the same thing carries over to Mashiach. That's what really, uh, that's what it really, uh, that's what it, it, it is talking about. It's not talking about like all nations and it's given into all. That's why I'm asking you, show me in the Torah and the prophets where something like this occurs. Because that's what um, Paul is using. He's using the Torah and the prophets to make this point. So if Abraham had all these things, if Abraham had all these things given to everybody, why didn't he do that? Do you believe that Paul's writing the scripture? Or do you believe that Paul's writing is just kind of like commentary on the Old Testament? I don't do you, believe he's writing neither. I believe that what he's doing is just writing letters. That's what Peter said. Okay, but do you believe that it's scripture? Um... I believe that people twist it just as much as they twist the regular scriptures. Yes, uh, on the problem. No. Okay, now I'm asking you: Do you believe that Paul's writings are scripture that you can put them on the same level or the same category as like the writings of Moses, uh, the prophets in the Old Testament? Um, they clearly, you know, said, they clearly said that they're building off of scripture. Scripture to them? No, 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 no. no. I'm asking you: Are they scripture? Not building off of scripture? No. Is that scripture? Are they authoritative? Mm -hmm. Sir, sir, you're you're missing, you're 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 misrepresenting something. Scripture is just Torah and the prophets. That's what scripture is. That, okay, so you, that, that sounds like you're saying no. You don't think Paul is scripture then? Because because yeah, I, I already said I already said it's not scripture. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. Thanks for your time. See that's well, you know, I, I'm I'm not gonna have a back and forth with somebody who doesn't believe that Paul's writings are are scripture and that and that they're not authoritative. That they're just hey, some wait, letters wait. that he wrote. So right. I'm not, you know, I, I'm I don't have conversations with people uh, who don't believe that. 
Okay, question. Did Peter say that uh, Paul's letters were scripture? I'm going to pull out some more scripture for you. Um, no, no, no. no. That's, I'm asking you, did Peter say that Paul's letters are scripture? Did he say that they are, did, when he said what Peter wrote was scripture, did he say that or did he say that they are letters? I don't and, know what, can, can you bring up a verse that, that you're referring to? Can you go to Second Peter chapter 3? All right, let's go to Second Peter chapter 3. All right. And while you're looking for that, uh, just to back up a question for what Mackie's talking about. So um, is there anything that you can pull from the Torah and prophets out in that, that backs what you're talking about uh, for Mackie if he doesn't accept uh, Paul? Um, well, I, I mean, it's already a problem if he doesn't accept the writings of Paul. I mean, there's no reason for us to even continue to have the discussion if he doesn't, you know, accept that Paul's writing is, is scripture and, and it's authoritative. You know what I'm saying? So if he doesn't believe that Paul's writing the scripture, then there's nothing that I can show him that will convince him otherwise. You know, he's already rejected Paul's writing a scripture. So okay, so just so just so I'm, let's let's say um, I'm I'm a, I'm a Torah only like I'm I'm a regular Jew, right? I don't take I don't take the New Testament one. If you, if you're doing your apologetics to me, you're saying you have nothing from the Torah or the Tanakh to make your point for me. I would have to I would have to accept the New Testament scripture for you to be able to do apologetics to me. Yeah, for us to have a discussion about uh, about scripture. But, you know, if a person is going to question what's in the Bible, especially the Bible that they claim that they read and believe in, then th there's no reason for me to even, um, you know, have a discussion about Scripture when you think that half of the Bible, uh, especially the new majority of the New Testament, is not authoritative. That is not Scripture. That's you know, not, um, to me, that, that that's a problem. That's not how that works, though. That, yeah, that's, not, that, that's how it works, is, because now i got to treat you like an unbeliever. Mackie, sure, is it possible sure. that Mackie can can ask his question again about the promises to get clarification? Wait, wait, wait. wait, wait. Let, let, let one thing be uh, be addressed at one time here, because I still am waiting for Second Peter chapter 3. Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead. And what he said, no, 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 I need, I need you to bring it up. I can't bring it up on my phone because it's going to kick me off the stream. Okay, uh, let me go. Yeah. Oh, no, you can bring it up. Go ahead. Oh, okay. All right, cool. Let me let me go ahead and do that. Uh, and then we'll let this be the last the last question. We'll let so real jump in because we're we're uh, eating up on Alan's time. He gave me two hours and we're already starting to go over. Yeah, it's my my bad. I'm I'm no, sorry. No, no, you no, that's all right. Go ahead. No, I went I on like these my discussions. Okay. <laughs> okay. Keep going down, please. Okay, I'll, I'll go slow. So, um, just let me know when to stop. Hmm. Oh, here it is. Here is okay. it second, uh, and, and to count the patience of our Lord's salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul uh, also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Uh, okay. As he does in all his letters when he speaks um, uh, uh, in them of these matters, mm -hmm. uh, there are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do other scriptures. So is, that, is that what you're is that what you're um is that what you're referencing? Yes, that's what I'm referencing. It says that they are letters that he wrote, okay. not scripture, letters. Okay. I'm not All saying right. not saying that they are not author, uh, authoritative. I've never said that. I said that what he is writing is a letter, not scripture, because scripture is Torah and the prophet, sir. That's the point. So when you when you when you have these conversations with people, especially and I know I'm sure you won't you wouldn't do it. But if a Jew, if a Jewish person came to you and does the same thing, you want to address them the same way that you're addressing me, because they don't they only look at the Tanakh. If mm -hmm. you not bring up anything in the Torah and the Tanakh and anything in the prophets, then, sir, your foundation is just as bad because Paul did not do that. Paul did not have Matt, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and reference those things. What he referenced was the Torah and the prophets. So I'm asking you the same thing again. I'm going to ask you the same thing again. Can you show me in the Torah and the prophets any promises given to Gentiles of any other nations 
that they were going to be kings and priests according to what was written in Genesis chapter 17 when the only individuals who became kings according to the most high standard were those that descended from Isaac. So wait, hold on. Are you telling me that the the ideology of a, a, a king was... It only derived from Israel. Israel was the only people on the planet that ever had kings. No other nation ever had kings besides Israel. Israel was the only one that had the standard of the Torah and to rule as a king the way that they did. That's why all the other nations submitted themselves to him just like they submitted themselves unto Solomon. So, yes, they were the only true living kings in that standard because they established the Torah and they ruled by it. I, I honestly don't don't get what you're what you're trying to say. I mean, because I, I think that it, it kind of seems like we're going down a rabbit hole. Because I mean, I, I brought up Galatians three and thirteen, and I mean it was clear um, where that the promises of Abraham was Christ. I mean that's that's what the Bible said. Now you either agree with that or you disagree with that. But you're not disagreeing with me. You're disagreeing with Paul. You're disagreeing with Scripture and the Bible. No, I have no hatred with Paul. I have no hatred with any of the people in the book. I have a hatred for people misinterpreting things. I'm asking you a specific question. And you can't even give me an answer. You could just easily well, no, because you no, because you talked about the promises. And you asked me what the promises were, and I read you Galatians three and thirteen, which clearly laid out what the promise was. You told me that I was wrong, and then you went into this whole thing about kings and israel being the only the, the only nation that had kings according to biblical standards That's i read you I, but i read you the promise what the bible says the promise of abraham was and you went into something else so to be clear though mac mac hold on real quick so to be clear mac asked you asked a very specific question about the torah and prophets so it's either a yes or no either you have a scripture from the torah and prophets or you don't what that christ is the um christ is the uh, uh the promise of abraham no, 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 no. My, que my, my question is, is that Abraham said the most I told Abraham that kings will come out of you. So what? OK, if that is a promise that cannot be disannulled because the most I made that promise, I am asking you who fulfilled that? Who is the only one that fulfilled what nation fulfilled that promises, fulfilled those promises? And how can you say it's given to some other ones when the prophets never said that? I'm asking you to show something like that. Okay, see, this is this is where you're confusing me. Are you okay? So you're asking me that God fulfill the prophecy of bringing kings from Abraham? Is that what you're saying? Is that what you're asking me? Did he did he fulfill that? Is is that what you're asking me? I'm asking, uh, do you believe that he did? Yes. Yes or no? Yes. Yeah, he did. There was a, there was a lot of kings that came from, from the lineage of Abraham. Cool. But I'm trying to figure out what, what does that have to do about the promise? Because the promise has everything to do with the fact of what you're talking about. Kings, priesthood, land, all of that was in that covenant mm -hmm. pertaining to what the Most High get. Who received what child of Abraham received the kingship, the priesthood, and the land? What child received that from Abraham's loin? I'm, 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 okay, I'm trying to figure out what you're trying to get at because when I'm reading the Bible, I'm not, no, 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 but hold on. I'm not trying to figure out who the heck was a king that descended from Abraham. I'm not worried about that. I'm worried about the promise, which is Christ. Galatians 3 and 13. That's what the Bible says. Because that's what we're looking to. I, you, you know, me trying to figure out who some king was that came from Abraham. What is what does that do? What, what, what does that do for anybody? How, how is that relevant to because, the conversation of salvation through Christ? Because Mashiach cannot be a king unless he descends from one. So I'm asking you, who who was the all those promises? All these promises came from. Through, through who? So that means, wait, hold on. So are you saying that everybody that's coming from Abraham has to be a king? I'm saying the promise says kings shall come out of thee. It's plural. Okay. King Did not kings come from, from Abraham? 
Kings did come from Abraham. Okay, so that was fulfilled. You asked me, did God fulfill that? The answer is yes. Who fulfilled it? God fulfilled it when he when he spoke it to Abraham, and then he had kings coming out of um kings coming from that lineage. What nation? Israel. Okay. Was that bloodborne Israel? Yeah, that was bloodborne Israel. Cool. Can any Gentile that's outside of the nation receive anything that like that if that's a promise only given to a bloodborne Israelite? Not for those people at that time, it because it's irrelevant to Gentiles today. It cannot be undone, sir. That's the whole point. But it's already been fulfilled, and that covenant is already done. It can no, 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 no because no, of, it is done. All right, Matthew, it, we're gonna leave it. We're gonna leave it right there. You got an answer to your question. It's starting to go back and forth to whatnot, but I appreciate it. Uh, we're gonna let So Real go in and close this thing out. How you doing, So Real? Hey, peace, everybody. Um, I just hey, wanted to make doing? some some little clarifying points. How you doing, Alton? Good to see you. Man. Hey, Bless good. You, how you doing, man? I'm <clears throat> doing great. Doing wonderful. All right. Um, you know, just just for clarification's sake, you know, he was asking about, you know, what is a covenant? You know, how is the mm -hmm. covenant made? Yeah. If you just go ahead to Genesis 15, you'll see that that's when God makes covenant with Abraham. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because he does it in the same way that you have a suzerain vassal treaty. You know, a suzerain was like a, you know, a, a, a king and a vassal was a person he conquered. And once that happened, it was like, OK, I'm going to make these rules. And so back then a covenant was made all types of uh, certain types of things went into it. You had witnesses that were there, you know, and of course, when it comes to God, his witnesses are, you know, the sons of God His, you know, his, uh, his children, his angels. And so, you know, when, when it came to Abraham, um, he had basically, you know, did what other ancient Near Eastern people did. He took some animals, um, cut them all in half, and what happens is, is that both parties are supposed to go ahead and walk through those animals and say, hey, if I don't fulfill my part, let what happened to those animals happen to me. Split me in half if I'm two-tongued or double-minded or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because Abraham was in a trance, and the only person that walked through was God, which means he is the one that is putting his own integrity on the line. And then from there, it's like when it comes to Abraham, because he didn't walk through it, it's like he has to depend on God. So God made like pretty much kind of like a one-sided covenant where it was like, you just have to trust my promise. You don't have to do anything uh, except what I tell you. You know, and so that, that's the way like that covenant was made. When it comes to whole everlasting language, um, you look throughout the Old Testament and that everlasting, that word everlasting was used in ways that people would never even conceive of in the West today. Um, they would talk about the everlasting hills being destroyed in Isaiah. Mm -hmm. How do you have hills that are everlasting, but they're being destroyed? You look in Hebrews 13 and the way that he ends out the epistle is that he takes that everlasting word and he actually applies it to the new covenant. He calls the new covenant, the everlasting covenant. So yeah. there's plenty of other scriptures I could give about what I just said, but I just want to throw those two out there um, just for brief, brief sake. Um, another thing is, is that about Isaiah 66, um, you can look at Jeremiah 35 and you could see in ways how there were Gentiles, I believe it was Rechabites, where it was saying that God would make them priests because, you know, they obey their father. Now, another thing you can do is you can also look in the Testament of the Patriarchs. Um, when you look in the Testament of the Patriarchs, you'll notice that in the Testament of Levi, chapter 2, verse 14, um, it says this. And they said to me, Levi, thy seed shall be divided into three branches for a sign of the glory of the Lord who is to come. And first shall be he that have been faithful. No portion shall be greater than this. The second shall be in the priesthood. The third, a new name shall be given over him because he shall arise as king from Judah and he shall establish a new priesthood after the fashion of the Gentiles to all the Gentiles. So you see some kind of hint at, you know, a Gentile priesthood there. 
you know, other places that you'll notice is this one takes a, a bit of time to read, but I'll just like speed through it. It's interesting because this reminds me of little events that happen in the New Testament. It's like the rejection of the Messiah and, you know, you get salvation, you know, through Jew, for the Jews through faith and all that. But listen to this and tell me if this sounds familiar about the new covenant, like in, in general and the events. Look at this. It says this. And out of covenantness, ye shall teach commandments of the Lord. And wedded women shall ye pollute. And the virgins of Jerusalem shall ye defile. And with harlots and adulteresses, ye shall be joined. And the daughters of the Gentiles shall ye take to wife, purifying them with an unlawful purification. And your union shall be like unto Sodom and Gomorrah. And ye shall be puffed up because of your priesthood lifting yourselves up against men, and not only so, but also against the commandments of God. For ye shall condemn the holy things with jests and laughter. Therefore the temple, which the Lord shall choose, shall be laid waste with your uncleanness, and ye shall be captives throughout all nations, and ye shall be a abandoned abomination unto them, and ye shall receive reproach and everlasting shame from the righteous judgment of God. And all who hate you shall rejoice over your destruction. And you were not to receive mercy through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, our fathers. Not one of our seed should be left upon the earth. And now I have learnt that the 70 weeks ye shall go astray and profane the, the priesthood and pollute the sacrifices and shall make void the law and shall set not for the words of the prophets by evil perverseness. You shall persecute righteous men and hate the godly. The words of the faithful you shall abhor. And a man who reneweth the law and the power of the Most High, you shall call a deceiver. And the last shall rush upon you to slay them, not knowing his dignity, taking innocent blood through wickedness upon your heads. And your holy places shall be laid waste to the ground because of him. And ye shall have no place that is clean, but ye shall be among the Gentiles a curse and a dispersion until he shall again visit you and in pity shall receive you through faith and water. I think it's interesting. That the last part of despite how bad the Jews were, that what they will, what will happen is not them coming back to the land, but that Christ would, you know, go ahead and visit them again in salvation through faith and water. What is that? That's water baptism, you know. And the reason why I read all that is because these are the types of things that echo the the type of eschatology and focus of the New Testament. Whatever Mac is talking about, that's not what the New Testament is talking about. That's not even what you know, the, the people who prophesied about the New Testament talking about Testament and Levi, you know, they're not talking about uh, kings coming out of Abraham still. That was all fulfilled. You know, they're talking about a, a priesthood, you know, from, from the Gentiles and stuff, you know. And so I don't know that you have all this other stuff that they're, they're talking about that echoes Matthew 24 and Luke 21, you know. And it's sad that, like, I, I don't know how they they can read all the stuff like that. Plus, jump into the pseudepigraphal stuff like I did, and they're still sounding like people from the New Testament. Yet they ignore that voice, and they still try to strum up all this stuff that no one from the New Testament pulls up to try to exegete out of it all. Um, right. But yeah, that's what I just wanted to share. There are other things, but I, I just wanted to share that. Yeah, I appreciate it, man. I appreciate it. But yeah. Um... You know, and you asked a, a pretty good que uh, question of how they read these things, um, and they don't, you know, and I'm not trying to blow shots, but I want to kind of put people in the perspective of the days that we're living in. Um, you know, 2 Timothy 4 and 3, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having engineers will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and, and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off in the midst. You know, and that's why, you know, with all due respect to Mackey, that's why I brought up a scripture directly dealing with what he was trying to ask in hindsight, which was Galatians 3 and 13. And I I mean, it's clear. 
You know what I'm saying? What the promise was, what, you know, cause everybody kept talking about the promise, the promise, even Jesus cleared it up. And I think that was in John. Uh, let me see. That was in John 10 and, uh, you know, no, actually, no, that was John eight. That was John eight. When they kept saying that they were the children of Abraham, it was just like, no, you're not the children of Abraham, you know, um, because if you were the children of Abraham, then you would be doing exactly what what I'm what I'm telling you to do. You know, you guys will be listening to me. Not only that, Moses wrote about me. So therefore, if Abraham is your father and you guys say that you live uh, uh, based on the law of Moses, then I mean, why do you guys still reject me? So um, and that's just to kind of, you know, bring everything back full circle, which once again, the, the topic of this discussion is about this was God's plan from uh, Genesis to Revelation that there was a remnant of people, people that he hand selected. And people might not like this term, but the Bible uses it. But, you know, there's people that God has predestined and it is not bloodline Israel. You know, once again, Israel was a part of the um, was a part of God's sovereign plan. They were not God. They were not the sovereign plan of God. God's plan was Christ, the seed of the woman uh, and the seed of Abraham. Right. That is cleared up. And that's what we're looking towards. You know, we, we can't continue to keep looking towards a group of people who failed many a times. Israel did some of the most wickedest things that that we've ever read about. I mean, there was rape, incest. They sacrificed their babies on the altars. They turned their backs on God. Plenty of times, you know, they went after idols. They went after, you know, false gods. They did. They started mocking. I mean, uh, uh, mimicking other nations. So why are we trying to look to those people, you know, at any at, at any point when those people they totally failed? We see that through the Bible, through the Old Testament, failure after failure after failure, and they were never a light to the nation. So we're not going to look at anybody now. And say that, oh, well, now we need to look to Israel. For what? Israel is not perfect. Christ is. Look to the perfect one, which is Christ. And if you don't want to look to Christ, then I'm sorry. You're not going to share. Um, um, you're not going to have a seat at the table in Christ's eternal kingdom. And that was basically my point. So I know that, you know, people wanted to try to, you know, push a certain narrative of, uh, well, there are certain groups of people. And then the Bible says this. I mean, when we read the Bible in this context about the seed, even when you read about the, the, the seed of the woman again and uh, 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 Genesis 3, Genesis 3 and 15, and then when you go to Revelation 22 and it talks about the lamb, when it talks about Christ and his bride at the end, that's what we're focusing on. So, um, but yeah, that's that's basically all I wanted to say on this, uh, on this topic. You know, I don't know. If uh, Orthodox more has a, has any more questions or anything like that, but um, that's basically my point in a nutshell. Yeah, the my only question is this now, like so. Uh, in closing it out, uh, this is a debate platform, so I would be remiss if I did not ask either one of you if you had any topics you were willing to debate or if you're looking for any debates at the moment. Oh, uh, I'm not. I mean, to be honest, I don't. I don't really go out looking for debates. People always come to me. <laughs> so, uh, I, I'm never, you know, I'm, I'm always open to having discussions with people. Uh, you know, I've had people who've emailed me and they wanted to come on my platform and, you know, we've had discussions. So I'm always open to, to the idea of a discussion, uh, depending on what the topic is, I'm always open. So, um, uh, you know, if you do invite me, then, Hey, you know, we, we can have another discussion. That's what's up. How about you? So real? Um, yeah, I, I can definitely say I'm, I'm pretty much in the same boat with, with Alton. Um, I know that uh, I spoke to Sal about last week, and um, one of the things I mentioned to him was I'm, I'm actually working on an app, um, and this app is basically going to be a, a simple question and answer app. It's going to be done sometime between April, May, or June, and mm -hmm. it's, I'm trying to get 150 questions. Um, answered and I'm working on it every day and the moment that it's out it'll just be out it'll be an app for Christians you know just be ten dollars and it's basically uh, 11 years of work put into these simple Q 
Q and A answers. And that way, you know, people could just go ahead and pull it up on their phone and they could pretty much just go ahead and, and read a lot of the questions and answers that they, they might, the, the questions that they get from professing Hebrews. And so what I wanted to do was I wanted to um, sometime in like a month or two, I wanted to come on this platform and just give a random set of numbers from 100 to 150 and whatever people would pick, you know, I would show what the question was and I would read my answer and I would see what people would have to say, um, you know, just, just to show it, you know, I think it'll definitely help, um, you know, just the Christian community in terms of a lot of questions that come from the Hebrews. But yeah, other than that, I'm still very open to, um, you know, any kind of discussions, not necessarily debates um, anymore, more more like discussions. I find them more meaning, more meaningful, more fruitful. You can get more things done. Mm-hmm. But yeah, other than that, they they got to come to me because I'm I'm pretty much like semi retired. I'm I'm like you know what I feel I know, like that's right. I'm, I'm I'm done. I, I said what I said, <laughs> you know. Right. <laughs> yeah, well, we're definitely doing a lot of dialogues these days. So uh, do me a favor and put your email in the back chat, and uh, we'll definitely reach out to you when there's a. Uh, uh, a bunch of dialogue sure on the horizon. Yeah. So with that family, I'm going to shut this show down. Um, I'm thinking about doing an after show. So uh, if you see the live, jump on. If you want to talk, feel free. You, the, the platform will be there for you. Um, but with that, I have uh, Alton's information uh, below. Um, so if you like what you heard, please go check out his YouTube channel or his Facebook. Um, I also have his email if you want to get a hold of him. I'm sh- and Alton, I'm sure I'm going to get a bunch of emails about people who want to uh, approach you for a debate. So uh, I'll probably be in touch with you in yeah. the future. <laughs> All right. Well, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, we'll just, I mean, you know, whatever information that you slide me, we'll, we'll just take it from there. <laughs> yes, sir. All right. Well, listen, you know, once again, man, I really appreciate you having me on, man. You know, you didn't have to open up your, your platform to me tonight, but you did. And, and I'm grateful for that. Um, and I want to thank everybody for, you know, who, who was watching, who was engaging in the chat and, uh, and, uh, you know, e- even, uh, uh, Mackie brother Mackie, who was on, you know, having a quick discussion. I, I do appreciate that. So, um, but yeah, I'm about to get out of here guys. And, you know, um, go ahead and check out the information in, in the, in the description and, uh, you know, check out my channel and, you know, if you guys got any questions or if you guys want to reach out to me. My information is down there, and you know we'll just go from there. <laughs> yeah, shout out to Sal for opening up, opening up his platform for us to to come through and host and bring people yes, on. Yes, sir. Uh, Thank you. Much gratitude to Sal. His information is down below. You can see it uh, scrolling across the bottom of the screen. So if you have it uh, within your ability to bless the brother for giving us over a decade of debates and discussions, please do so. Much appreciated. Yeah, support, uh, guys, support. So with that family, I'm going to close out and say peace and love. All right. Thank you.